Dylan, I don't know if you can hear me, but we can see you guys. We, you're just muted. Yes, we're working on some uh, audio. There you, there you go. I think you're good. I think you're good. I think you're good. Well, this is through the. <laughs> How about that? Can you guys hear us now? We can. Yeah. Are you guys getting echo on your end at all? How about that? Is that better? Good for okay. me. Better for me. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Dylan, right, if anybody is joining. Down. If anybody's joining with their laptop in that room, just make sure their mic's muted. Okay, thanks. Well, I think we got the audio issues fixed. We're still grabbing some chicken and we'll get started in two minutes. So it's like a word you want to eat and put it in the introduction, you want to, you know, you start doing the last game. And this is like a fire map of Bob. You can start wagging my back and working with the whole darn thing. Just about to look after the burn, but you know. Predominantly, you have, you know, officially, I mean, it, there's a few areas we have that second third inch in the bird, bird scenario, and it appears, you know, anecdotally. That those are, you know, you're seeing isolated kick utilization, and you know because there's that, yeah, those, you know, you know, you know, you know it's just another, you know, things are, you know, triggering on that. But it would be since ice grid is such a mega fire, it'd be really interesting to see, you know, now that you you collected the initial data, you know that like. Right after the fire, I mean, they they utilize they like that. But now you know, six to eight year time frame, you know, that heavy timber and you know those mega fires, you know, that canopy is is burned as well. You know, when that starts coming down, what is the impact? But it sure seems like there's a lot of avoidance of those heavy down by three drops areas. And two well Oh, right. Yeah. Remember, you always said that. All day, that was the team. That was all there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, everybody, if we can uh, maybe find a seat. And uh, I feel like I need to talk loud, but I don't know. Is that sound loud on your end? You guys are good? Thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Uh, so, yeah, grab if you haven't grabbed something, find your way uh, to the table. But thanks for coming to the CAC. And uh, we're going to give it a shot on a hybrid meeting. Uh, some of our guests couldn't make it here and our distinguished guests are out of town. So we're going to accommodate uh, so you can get the information from them. But what I'd like to do real quick, again, you know, we've got some new faces in here, some people from the public even that I see have made it. Uh, if we could just do a real quick, you know, round table, just where you're, you know, where you're representing or where you're from or whatever, uh, keep it short. And uh, then we'll fire off into, I'll go into a little bit more about our agenda and how we're going to run the meeting and we'll, Hopefully have a good uh, CAC tonight. Got some good topics and then we'll look at some future topics potentially. I've got a couple ideas I'd like to throw out for our portion of it, but lead it off. I'm Lee Anderson. I'm the regional supervisor here for Fish, Wildlife and Parks out of Kalispell. So why don't we, we'll go around the table initially here on our members and then we'll work our way around the room, but fire off with right. Mark. My name is Mark Christensen. I live here in Kalispell, uh, employed down at Wheaton Cycle, uh, avid cyclist, really into hunting and fishing and outdoors, and uh, have a vested interest in all that. So. Great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Clifford Kipp. Uh, I live on the east side of Kalispell, and I work for the Montana Conservation Corps. Jay Sheffield, representing Libby area, and uh, hunter fisherman, and, and uh, member of the Libby Riding Gun Club. So. Corey Anderson. Uh, I live in Columbia Falls, and I'm a forester by trade. Uh, Tucker Landerman, I uh, live here in Kalispell, originally from the Blackfoot Valley, a uh, lifelong hunter and fisherman, and pretty much anything outdoors. <clears throat> Tucker? I'm Cody Foreman's a local from the Whitefish area. I live in Kalispell now. Landowners, outdoorsmen, civil engineer. Eric Brown, work at the hospital uh, play outside over here in Kalispell. Dave Landstrom, Fish Wild Open Parks, Fox and Rec Parks and Outdoor Recreation Manager. Uh, Ian Wargo uh, from Kalispell here, born and raised. And, uh, yeah, big into that. Uh, hunting, fishing, outdoors. And, uh, yeah, civil engineer by trade also. Uh, Dylan Tabish, Communication and Education Program Manager for Fish Wild Open Parks, based in Kalispell. All right, and off camera, we'll start here and we'll finish around this way. Go ahead, Nate. Nathan Reiner, the game warden captain at Kalispell. Sean Cox, maintenance manager at Kalispell. Neil Anderson, wildlife manager at Kalispell. Macy Dugan, access manager at Kalispell. Stephanie Brown, access and landowner relations bureau chief out of Helena, but I live here in Kalispell. Mike Kansky, fisheries program manager. Lindsay Baker, admin. Hambo. GL Hamilton, I go by Ham. Fish Walton Parks here at Kalispell. I'm going to do the AAS. I'm an international active hunter. There you go. An active yeah. international hunter. There you go. <laughs> Sir? Uh, just a uh, local. Uh, and what was your name? Fishing game hunter, Doug Andrews. <coughs> oh, okay. Thanks for coming, Doug. Appreciate it. Benny Rosetto, uh, long time uh, resident here, uh, retired physician. I was on the first. Uh, uh, CAC committee. Uh, I've been on the Conference of Disease Committee and I've been looking at the, the management plan that we soon afterwards had to implement and uh, was on the model line committee. Uh, you got a monumental award coming, maybe even in hunter education. Oh, yeah, 30 years. About 30 years. Yeah. 
coming up uh, in March. Awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, how about we go to the big screen here? Uh, I don't know how you guys view it, but I'll go top around them. And uh, I got Pat, you're up first, and then we'll just work our way around. Hi, everybody. I'm Pat Tabor. I'm the vice chair of the, the Fish and Game Commission, and I represent Region 1. I live in Whitefish. Yeah. Um, Jody Loomis, Parks and Outdoor Recreation Board Member, District 1, and I'm in Helena. Joe Navone uh, in Big Fork. <clears throat> I'm Molly Vandervoort and I'm in Whitefish. I'm a public health professional serving uh, the federal government. And Molly is also the chair of the CAC. So uh, work with her on setting up this agenda and further agendas down the road, but she is the CAC point of contact, you know, to get things done and get moved through to make sure we get it done here. So uh, we'll make sure we got things covered though in the room since you didn't, didn't make it down here, Molly. All right, we have a couple left. Uh, who's left here? That introduction. Kayla. Oh, okay. There we I'm go. Kelly. Yep. Kayla. Kelly. Hi, I'm Kayla. I'm a recreation coordinator for Canixi Land Trust in Thompson Falls. Um, I kind of serve the Sanders County area. Perfect. And I'm Shelly Coldiron. I'm in Whitefish. I'm a hiker. Rock climber and boulder, love the outdoors. All right, great, you guys. If you just, uh, I guess, have her muted unless we uh, call on you, so we don't hear you talking on the phone or watching TV while we're having a meeting here. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, first thing we wanted to do tonight, uh, Commissioner Tabor, uh, glad he could. Uh, get tuned in here we just had a recent commission meeting uh with some things that were directly associated with region one um but we would just ask pat that if you want to give a, a general update on, on all things uh that the commission has going that you want to share uh perhaps we may have a couple questions from uh cac uh to you but go ahead you've got the floor uh, we accounted for about a half hour so uh fire away on whatever you got Great, thank you, Lee. Um, so good evening, everybody. We we did just come off of a commission meeting yesterday. Not sure if any of you tuned in on it. Um, some of the region one items that we were looking uh, very specifically at is uh, one, it started off as a petition uh, for some of the homeowners in Church Slough uh, where they wanted to create some boating restrictions in particular focused on wake boats and and, uh, and the ones that create those big huge waves that you can surf behind um and this is kind of on the uptick statewide where we have bodies of water with a variety of different competitive interests both on the water and then the people that own around it and um so it's starting to become a bit of a challenge in this case and it's following a pattern that the commission i I believe feels pretty strongly is the right way to go is rather than responding to a petition, which is either a, an up or a down, um, is to try to put together citizens groups that can work together and come to a solution. So that's what we did with Church Slew. There was two uh, professionally facilitated meetings by the department. Dylan was materially involved as were other enforcement people from region one and I think they sent over a facilitator from Helena if I was mistaken Dylan and um, the end result was they had two meetings and came up with a set of recommendations unfortunately the recommendations they came up with um, certainly from the from the opinion of the department in particular really probably didn't get after what what would be really achievable from an enforcement standpoint and so in all cases, when we look at what types of regulations we want to put in place, they have to be understandable and they have to be enforceable. Otherwise, why have it? Because people will tend to violate right off the bat. We kind of have a bit of a bigger, broader issue because we have a total of seven slews 
we also have a, a petition that was filed and um, a group is going to be formed for Lake 5. And this is just on the uptick. This, this is kind of what comes with the territory when you start having more and more users and everybody's form of recreation is, is righteous in its own right, but it, but it can conflict with somebody else's form of recreation. Um, and so one of the tasks that we have is, is to try to sort through that. The interesting thing about, you know, when we look at water and management of water is, is staying focused on what really is the charge of the commission. First and foremost, that's the protection of the resource. And when I say the resource, I, I really want to emphasize that it's it's really about fish and game, right? It's not land resource because in this case, there's quite a bit of private land involved, and we'd have no jurisdiction over private land. That's private property rights and everything else. So so we have to be careful when people say, well, we want you to do something because you need to help us protect our land. That's not really within the charge of the department or the commission. We also need to be really focused on health, safety, and welfare, in particular safety on the water, whether there's the potential for conflict and, and, and ultimately leading to some, some kind of tragic accident. And we certainly don't need that. And, and then the enforceability piece. So the recommendations that came from the work group fell short of that. Um, if anybody was is here in the room that worked on that group, I, I wanna express my appreciation, the appreciation on behalf of the commission of the work you guys put into it. I know that working on some of these, these citizens groups where you're really trying hard to come to recommendation um, and then you go through all that effort and, and ultimately the commission doesn't adopt it, that can be frustrating. We have not given up, but the charge that I put back on the department yesterday and we're going to look at this more on a region-wide basis and perhaps a statewide basis is we're going to try to focus on a solution in totality so that, that we have one application of rules and regulations rather than having, you know, in this case with seven slews, seven different types of programs of compliance, because that gets super confusing for the users, gets really complicated for enforcement to try to keep people on the straight and narrow. Um, so that's the approach we're going to make. I heard uh, the deputy um, director yesterday commit to the fact that they're going to put the resources together necessary to start looking at this issue of, of how to handle the additional both technology that's starting to occur on the water with the different types of crafts, as well as the crowding that's ensuing. Um, Lake Five will be a tricky one because I think if anybody is familiar with that body of water, it's was already small to begin with. There's already a lot of users on it and they do everything under the sun, everything from swimming, paddle boarding to skiing. And there is a, a really interesting array of opinions there. So um, we're gonna have a, a work group come together and try to come up with some recommendations on that. And I wanna mention that that's really separate than what's going on right now that, that leaves crowds running relative to getting opinion in, in terms of this, this FAS site that would be located in at Lake Five to give a little bit of additional park in. I'm sure Lee will cover some of the, the details on that, but that's just a further complication relative to what is uh, perhaps one of the, the busiest little bodies of water there could possibly be in the region. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the committee comes forth on that. Most of the decisions were really related to fisheries and what have you. Um, there wasn't any really shocking or, or different um, elements coming through. Although one of the uh, interesting debates that occurred was on the Missouri, the upper Missouri, in particular focusing on walleye and whether there should be additional harvest in walleye uh, in hopes of the protection of, of the trout. And, and so at one point I asked the question, so, do we have our walleye guys and our trout guys? Are they are they arguing here or what's happening here? Because trying to understand the science of what's happening on the on the portion of the river where literally as short as 10 years ago, these these fish weren't present. Now they're present in a very material way. And the question remains, although it, I don't think from a biological answer we have the exact answer. Are you know are are a lot of the the, the uh, developing trout you know uh, considered prey to these these walleye and is that going to have an impact on what what is a very important trout fishery in the Upper Missouri? So um, 
Ultimately, the commission decided to take no action and leave it, leave the standards as they are right now. But I think on a lot of these things, what's more important is, is having the conversation and the debate and then the public coming back as they did in this case and really challenging both the commission and the department to, to, to do more work, to get more science, to really understand this. And, and I think the department agreed to you know, starting to really look at, at what's in the bellies of these walleyes to, to, to really understand exactly what they're feeding on and whether we should be concerned about them or what else might be having an impact on the trout if it isn't on the walleyes. But it was a real pointed example of where we want to drill down and make sure that we got the best science available to us before we, we alter any types of opportunity for, for anglers at all. Um, as you guys know, uh, there's a lot of hard work going on. I know Ian and others of you are involved in, in trying to get feedback to the department uh, to ultimately come to the uh, elk management plan. There was a pretty uh, couple of really important monumental gatherings, uh, you know, elk camp in, in, um, in the Capitol a couple of weeks back. Uh, the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association had a very extensive kind of group growth to try to figure out all the different solutions that are being discussed and whether there's ones that are being ignored. So I think there's a genuine intent by all the parties involved to get after what will be a, a meaningful health plan, we'll get it approved, and then hopefully have good, strong public concurment with it before we enter into the biennials starting at the end of this year and to, to be approved in 2024. Um, we should see a fishing uh, statewide fishing management plan, I think in the spring, I'm not quite sure when the commission's gonna see it, whether it'll be at the April meeting or at the June meeting. This is gonna be a very important document. The commission's already called for the department to be much more um, prescriptive and deliberate uh, relative to both the value system and the goals and objectives. So, um, that's a very important issue. I think when it comes out for public scoping and comment, I really hope that folks in the region get materially involved and let us know what you think. Because if we do the plan right, and this is true of the elk as well, then we have guidance and, and agreed upon philosophy prior to commission making decisions that we can rely on. And that's, that's really how a well-managed system should work. We should establish what our goals and objectives and value systems are in, in the form of a plan and then as we assess site-specific decisions, we're, we're trying to adhere to the principles of that plan wherever we can. Um, so with that, I'll stand down. I know Jody's probably got some comments and then hopefully we still have some time to, to answer any questions. It's really your guys asking us questions. Even if it's not in this forum, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you don't think I'm aware of stuff and, and you're concerned about some of the decisions that are being made or you need more information, please, please reach out to me. Um, it's important that I hear from you. So thank you, Lee. Great. Thanks, Commissioner Tabor. Uh, one thing I, I would mention real quick since uh, Pat uh, touched on it is Lake 5. And we have a decision notice that's out right now. It's posted on our department website uh, for comment. And it's for us to receive a four acre addition to the existing fishing access site through a life estate that we would get it, get it donated to the department upon the passing of uh, the current occupant of that property, um, but it would be a donation. And, and essentially, if you know the fishing access site, it's this rectangle with this tiny little spit that runs down to the lake, really narrow, about 150 feet wide, where the boat ramp is and the dock and stuff is. And this would essentially take this other undeveloped chunk of four acres and make a rectangle that goes all the way to it. So it adds about 250 feet of shoreline to it, but we are not proposing to do any development on that site. Uh, we aren't gonna expand parking. We're not gonna expand boat trailer parking. We're not gonna do uh, improvements like that. This is just gonna be an addition of land so that in hopes people will be able to actually recreate uh, non-boaters. They have some more shoreline that they can move away from the boat trailer uh, area, the boat ramp and the dock. That's where we seem to have some of the conflicts because it's such a narrow little strip. Now there'll be some shoreline, but we don't plan to expand parking. Um, we don't plan on 
doing anything to increase there other than have a little bit more space for people that actually that are there to, to spread out a little bit more. You know, I think uh, Commissioner Tabor hit on it. It's a pretty busy lake. And so we're not going to propose to do any more development of that site. Uh, we're, we're content with where it's at right now. And, but that would be a free donation to the department. So it may happen in a year if it is approved. It may be 10. We don't know how long it'll be. But the thought is upon the death of that gal, then, then it would be donated to the, the family. Or I mean, from the family to uh, the department. So that's like five uh, FAS. Um, Anything else on that site, Dave, uh, about it? No, no that's okay. a good, good description. And that's a totally separate entity from the public petition that came in to change some voting regulations on it. They're, they're two divergent uh, actions that are unrelated. Um, they may cross paths on maybe what's going on with the lake, but they're not. They're separate processes and separate uh, actions. So, um, but I just wanted to clear that up. And maybe before we go to... Uh, to Jody, if we have any questions that you may have directly for Commissioner Tabor on anything he said or anything that's just happened recently, we'll hit him with those and then we can move on to uh, Jody Loomis from the Park Board uh, after that. Is there any any questions from anybody directly? Eric, go ahead. I, would, I was just going to uh, say I was on the Church Slew Work Group and um, I appreciate the decision that Commission made and I think uh, the recommendation, unfortunately, was kind of the problem with the compromise gets complex and um, so I think that yeah I was glad to see that when it was published that they made that decision and look forward to hopefully a simpler answer. I appreciate your time on it too. Could you hear that Mr. Tabor? I did uh, and I would ask guys that are a little bit farther away to speak up a little bit more but I, I did just I kind of had to wince to, to listen to that but I appreciate that comment. One of the things that I'd love is more feedback on what we can do. Because one of the things I said at the meeting yesterday to the department was, let's be fair to these people that are volunteering their time and give them tighter parameters so that they know that if they're coming up with a recommendation almost from the get-go that isn't enforceable, you know, be fair to the people and just say, hey, thanks guys going for going down that line. But actually that isn't really going to probably work. So, so we got to kind of take that one off the, the table. And so um, I think we're learning about this process. We're learning a lot about petitions. I, I would encourage you, if any of you guys want to effectuate a change, if you go the petition route, you really lock in the commission of the either saying, yes, we'll do it or no, we won't without any kind of public process and, and, without any really proper vetting by the department. In fact, in a lot of cases, because a petition goes directly in front of the commission, the department isn't even most of the time in a position to express an opinion. So what I've asked legal counsel and the director's office to do is come up with a kind of like a flow chart or something as a preferred methodology that if you guys want to effectuate a fairly substantive change, that we have a process that you can follow where it has a much greater chance of collectively getting people involved and moving through the system in a manner that it has a much greater chance of ultimately coming to a positive change so we don't waste anybody's time. And uh, I just appreciate the hard work that you guys put in on that, that working group because I know you worked really hard and you did get to compromise. So um, I applaud you for that because that's not always easy. <laughs> you know, when you have such diverse opinions with groups of people. So I uh, appreciate the hard work. Anybody else have a question for Commissioner Tabor? And, okay, so why don't we shift and uh, we'll go to Jody Loomis with the Parks Board. If you want to give any update or uh, feel free to fire away. Oh, well, thank you very much. I just had a couple of things to be pretty quick here. Um, the Parks Board uh, last met in December and we had a pretty light um, agenda, but we did kind of a final piece to the reorganization of, of the department. We've added to our, um, our land acquisition policies to we're now you know officially 
parks and outdoor recreation has been added. So it's not just the parks department. So we're parks and outdoor recreation. So that makes me think about winter recreation right now. And um, you guys know that FWP does a just fantastic job of managing a snowmobile grooming program throughout the state. I think we have about 3000 miles of groom trails and, and I believe there's about 700 um, in region one. And um, so I was talking to the program manager here lately of the grooming program, and we're kind of teetering on a, on a spot where if we lost another a, a groomer or had some problems like that, we wouldn't be able to replace it with the current level of funding that we have. The, the, uh, these machines have gotten so expensive. Um, the program is funded through all through user fees, whether registration, fuel tax fees, the trail pass, um, the trail pass that is required to, to take a vehicle on these groomed routes. Um, so uh, what they're, um, what one thing I think we're looking at um, is there hasn't been an economic uh, study done since 2013. And so we've got some, some language added to a, a bill that, um, is in the legislature right now that would help with this economic study going forward. And of course, that the study really in the past, that one that was done by um, MS, uh, U of M, I believe, um, it, uh, it really detailed all of how the money flows into the local communities, um, restaurants and so forth um, from all the people coming into Montana and staying and traveling and these kind of things. So um, if we could get another economic study done, it would certainly show the growth of the sport. And that would help that would help going forward if we need to um, go to the legislature, possibly increase some fees. So um, coming down the road that we'd be able to to have the funds to keep the program going. Um, so I know like for example right now um, West Yellowstone's got four machines. They were down to one. Now they're back up to three and they're having a hard time keeping up. But um, hey, we've had a really good snow year uh, overall. So um, that's exciting. Um, that particular bill I was talking about is House Bill 333. And it looks like it's scheduled for third reading in the House. And it's almost unanimous uh, at this point. So I think it's gonna happen. So that'll give us some good numbers coming next legis next legislative session. Um, I think our next next meeting most likely will be end of April, um, probably after the legislative session. Um, and I know one thing on most likely on the agenda item will be um, Summers Beach um, there on Flathead Lake. Um, we're gonna have some some improvements probably come before the parks board at that time to our our newest state park. So that's gonna be exciting and we'll look forward to, to seeing uh, what kind of improvements we come up with. Um, I know that it's been out for public comment and so um, it's gonna be pretty exciting. It's gonna be a great park um, right there, right at the north end of, of uh, Flathead. So, um, that's all I got on my list. Great, thanks Jody. I think you teed up a good uh, topic of discussion right now with Summers Beach State Park and us working on uh, comment and, and decision notice, et cetera. And I just put Dave Landstrom on the spot. If you wanna just give an update maybe of where we're at sure. in that process, Dave, I think yep. that would be good. Uh, Board Member Lewis is correct. We've just recently wrapped up a 30 day comment period on a, on a, on a development EA and we provided a, a host of options, development alternatives, ranging from, uh, of course, no action to uh, the addition of a variety of visitor amenities. We have, like we have had through the entire project, we've had strong public participation. Uh, we've received over 200 written responses um, and, and opinions are, are wide and varied, as you can imagine. So we're uh, sorting through those and responding to them and having a look at what folks have to say and what their preferences are. And um, we're, we're, we're a ways off from a decision on that yet. We've got a lot of comment to review and analyze, and, um, but we're getting closer. And so we should hopefully be able to get a decision notice out 
um, you know, yet this winter. And uh, and then you're right, uh, uh, Jody, we'll be heading your way with, <laughs> in the event that we select an alternative that, that does involve some development of amenities, then we'll be bringing that to the board. Yeah, because as many of you know, we've done, I mean, there's been a lot of these public comments, there's multiple processes that we're going through from the acquisition to the initial work that's done on it. And you know, we did do the initial stuff. We've got a parking area. We did some work on the dynamic beach, you know, to deal with erosion. And now we get down to things about limited camping, potentially, you know, a fee booth a station for the camp, for a camp host or a, a site post to be. And those are the things that we're discussing now is that final influx of capital, if you will, uh, for that site and how it's gonna look potentially uh, trail, uh, some other other things and so we have to gauge the public's interest on that and look for issues and then we would make a decision then on what alternative that's going to be if it's one of the the two or three that we came up with or a hybrid potentially of those and, and we go to the parks board with that after after that's done so it's a NEPA requirement environmental policy act that we go through that but we want to get that that input from the public but does anybody have any anything for uh for Jody with related to parks board uh, type of issues or anything like that uh, that we could key off of here. And if not, he might be off the hook. No, I would just wanted to ask uh, around Beaver Lake, I know they're used to groom around there on the trails. Is that still a possibility for, you know, cross country skiing and stuff? Um, that would all be on DNRC land and fall within the Whitefish Legacy Partners easement area. So we haven't done any there, um, Shelly, but uh, I think, actually, I think there was a private vendor there, the Whitefish Bike Retreat that might have been doing that, um, but not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. No. One other thing I was going to tee up to everybody related to parks was that we just put out our news release that uh, your Smith River permit drawing results are out. And uh, you'll be happy to know that there was 14,497 applicants. And I did not steal from any of you because I didn't draw either. <laughs> uh, so, but they were out, as you know, or you may not know, there's 1,470 permits that are available. Uh, and this year, Montana residents drew 902, non-residents drew 568. And I don't believe that we have a, a cap on that. I think it's anybody and everybody can apply. I'm not, I'm about 99% sure on that, but uh, so we got a mixed bag, about twice as many residents as non-residents. But so go online, check and see if you drew and hope for good weather and actually some runoff. And uh, yeah. you get a chance to float and have sunshine, rain, snow, hail, all in one three-day trip if you've ever experienced it. But neat opportunity there. Uh, go ahead, Kayla. Okay, so I had a couple of questions. Um, for Jody, the economic study you're talking about, what are kind of the, the parameters around that that you were looking at? just for like snowmobile or all types of winter recreation and like the whole region or what specific kind of well I'm not sure what the how far they're going to go with the the new study that they're, they come up with the previous one I should have pulled it out and, and, and looked at it um it was it was snowmobile usage and um as I recall and um yet it went into local uh, broke it down local communities and, and all it was spent uh gasoline uh uh on the machines um a lot of miles traveled um dollars spent in in local restaurants and th those kind of things were was was on the previous one okay um and then i was also wondering um Oh, I'm terrible with names. I forgot the the guy's name in the room that was talking about the uh, the summer's uh, public survey. Is that mm -hmm. is that survey 
uh, posted anywhere to look at? Like, I would just be curious to look at what the questions were on it and things like that. Yeah, well, thanks to Dylan Tavish, we have a Summers Beach State Park webpage uh, oh. that you can reach through the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks webpage. And it will have everything we've done in regards to that new state park since we acquired it in, in uh, 2021. So all of our presentations, all of the survey work, all of the public scoping, everything we've done, you can view uh, retroactively on that page. And so uh, if you can't, if you're not finding it easily, I think it's it's pretty easy to find off our landing page. Yeah, Dylan, I just but, put it in the chat there for you, Kayla. Um, yeah, thank you. PDF. Yeah, it's a really interesting study. We got 1,200 responses. Yeah, we did. On the initial scoping tool, we had 1,200 responses. And you're welcome. If you're reading that and you have questions, feel free to give me a call. And I'm happy to go through all of that with you. Can you remind me your name? I'm terrible with names. Dave, Dave Landstrom. Thank you. Um, Great. Well, I think there's one other topic we wanted to give a quick update on, and I'm going to look to Neil Anderson. Um, so we've got this. Um, well, I'm going to post it in the chat for you folks online and everybody here in person. You've got a report. Uh, it's an update on the elk project in Sanders County. That's pretty, pretty awesome. And so Neil was going to give a quick update. That that. Is, um, is everybody kind of familiar with what we're doing there? Or is this fairly new to a lot of folks? So we initiated a pretty large scale research project over in the Noxon area. So Noxon between Noxon and the Thompson Falls, primarily on the, the west and south side of the Clark Fork River and looking at elk, but it's more than just elk. It's looking at habitat, habitat use, um, predation, um, all, basically anything that might impact elk and elk numbers down there. Um, so a big part of that is capturing a lot of elk. <clears throat> and this is the first year we've, we've started our capture operations. Uh, we started using clover traps down there, which are basically it's a box trap with a, a dropping doors. It's ground capture effort. Um, and then they just finished up a, a helicopter effort over two days. Where they caught uh, 37 elk out of the helicop helicopter, which is probably the some of the most difficult country in Montana to capture an elk in. And it was pretty hairy, lots of timber, um, those kind of things. But yeah, on the report, it'll, it, you know, it says we caught 62 elk so far. We're going to continue trapping in there probably for the next week and a half, maybe two weeks. Um, I'll go down there next week and try to help them out a little bit too. Um, with the goal of getting a few more calves, maybe a few more females and some males. Um, but again, I'm pretty excited about the project. Um, it's supposed to be pretty much like I say, an all inclusive study, um, looking at all those things that affect elk. And this summer, we'll be trying to get catching uh, collars on bears. And we've already caught three lines. We're hoping to get a few more for radio callers on them as well, and some wolves in addition to that. So, um, you know, there's maps and different things and where all the capture locations are. Um, but it, it's about a five year study. Um, we'll be replenishing whatever comes out of this project, you know, in terms of mortalities, try to keep those collar numbers up. And so there'll be subsequent uh, captures over that, at least the next three years. It, it's a it's a pretty cool study. Um, it took a long time to get this thing in place. And so we're pretty excited to have it. The goal is to try to use this information and to the extent we can apply it to the rest of the region so we can learn it, learn from it and adapt to it in our management uh, of, of elk across the region. Anybody have any questions on that? Yeah. Can you just talk about why you picked this area as opposed to other areas in the region? Yeah, so we, we actually had a proposals in for three different areas. One of them was in the, the Bob Marshall area. Um, well, this one, and then I believe one was uh, the Tally Lake area. Um, and we felt this one had the best chance of actually um, informing us one, there's a lot more out there. So figure we can get some callers out, um, informing us more on what looks, the rest of the region looks like. Um, plus we have a lot more ability to interact with the Forest Service and the management activities in this area than say like the Bob Marshall. So that's why it kind of fell out as a priority. They actually had some uh, some timber management plans for this area already. So we're hoping to take advantage of that and see how that impacts elk use, habitat use and forage. So a big part of the forage will be not only what they use, but also looking at for um, you know the overall quality of that forage. 
Uh, kind of as a side note, uh, I talked to Kelly Prophet. She's a research biologist. I was working on helicopter captures. And all, those, uh, all the ones that were captured with the helicopter were all on Forest Service. And she said they're really tough shape this year. And she got a lot of those females. And she said, you can already see their backbones. A lot of them, she's worried that some of them might die. Um, and also noticed that there's a pretty good browse line um, across all the winter range that they're using right now. So, so that's one of the things that we're looking at, to, you know, habitat as well as predation and eliminating numbers down in that area. So yeah, it's, it was kind of a judgment call on where we thought we could get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of a, a project, and that was that was it. Um, we're going to be turning in some more proposals for other areas, probably the the Bob Marshall or or you know, South Fort Pape area. Okay. Um, and there's some yielding projects coming up. And there's a bunch of different things going on. It's going to be a busy place over the next few years. Um, and we're also, I don't know if you want me to mention that we're planning on having some yielding discussions coming up here in March to go over what we learned from the recent yielding project, as well as talk about yielding management and how we move forward. So, we need some of those. Thanks, Eric. I think one thing I'd throw out to the CAC is that. Uh, this spring, well, even the project will last for five years, but we're doing captures and stuff for three, and you got to keep things on the on the radar, you know, so you may need to trap more or, what, or whatever. But uh, this spring, during the calving season, you know, one of the things that has to happen is uh, we want to go out and collar calves. I mean, as soon as they hit the ground, we want to go collar calves. And uh, they have these transmitters and some of these females, they got 25 of them in the implants so that we know when, when that drops that you, know, you got a basic general area and the way Neil describes it, then you get a bunch of people and you go up there and you try to find this calf before it gets too mobile and then you can collar it. That way you can see if it dies from exposure, gets eaten, lives, blah, 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 all those things. And it's a, it's a labor intensive effort because you're just searching around a general area to find one of these little calves and anybody's been in the woods, these little buggers can hide pretty good. So we, we may be looking for some volunteers uh, at that time. We're kind of trying to fine tune a little bit the trapping effort. You know, everybody wants to go out there and get your hands on these elk. And so we'll get this first year, I think, behind us on the, the clover traps and that kind of stuff. But we're going to be looking to get some help from people trapping uh, wolves uh, as well. That'll be a real, real managed type of thing to help us. Uh, get things done there. Um, but if you guys want to participate, um, we'll do everything we can to make it happen. And that may be one of the first real good opportunities of being in the field to actually get your hands hands dirty and, and slap a collar maybe on an elk calf or something like that. But if, if it doesn't happen this year, we've got three years of heavy, heavy use. And maybe you're a plant guy, I don't know, and you really want to go up and snip some uh, vegetation, look at some <laughs> transects for habitat study, but that's not the way I roll. I want to get my hands on an elk. So. <laughs> Full disclaimer, though, we did have a volunteer out on the mule deer project a few years ago, and he wasn't in there 10 seconds before he got kicked in the face. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not as romantic as it sounds. <laughs> it may follow you around forever. It does. Yeah. But we need the help, and we want people participating in groups like this, as well as other other groups and people in the community because you get buy-in and you're, you are part of, you know, the solution. You're part of, of wildlife management that way and you get to see things firsthand and have some uh, some ownership. So we'll be we'll be putting a call out when that happens and you'll get a, some tentative dates and we'll try to manage as many as we can. We can't have 500 volunteers running around because that's a, that's a recipe for disaster too. But if you're interested, we'll be in touch. Okay. What, what's the 10 second version of how those things work? The, oh. the, those VIT transmitters. Yes, yeah, so there's <clears throat> there are different types out there right now. They're they the technology where there's it's a proximity sensor basically. So as long as it's within proximity of the elk's collar, so the elk has got a radio collar on it as right. well, puts out puts out a certain pulse. And when they separate, it puts out a different pulse. So when the calf's born, it pushes that thing out onto the ground. Out of the ground. System. Yeah. And then it's got a backup system that's heat sensitive. And so as it cools down, so it should be at elk's body temperature. As it cools down, it also puts out a different pulse. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways you know that it's on the ground. Right. And, and she's expelled it. And then you can kind of go in and look. But it also will help us identify areas where they're calving. So, sure. um, you know, we only have, what, 25 of those implants in there. And we won't, I think we're looking to catch around, catch around 60 elk calves if we can. And so it will also help us identify calving grounds. Yeah. And some of it's just a random search. You 
find a bunch of elk and you go in there and see if you can find some calves. Yeah. Uh, but you. we have to be pretty careful, and that's one of the things that we talked about is you know, we gotta be kind of a little bit careful when you're handling the calves, and most of the time you have gloves on and stuff, so you don't want to a bunch of human scent on them. You know, try to minimize the likelihood that mom will abandon that calf. And we've been pretty successful. We've done it a lot of different places. And yeah, and you can catch them one to how many days before they're just yeah, it all depends. Um, you know, but by the time they're about a week old, they get yeah. to be pretty, pretty yeah, tough. But I've been on in on these things where you, um, you don't even already have to handle the calf. Yeah. You walk up and it's laying on the ground and it just kind of stands up. <clears throat> so it's it's amazing that they don't run right away. But sure, they're not built to do that. But a couple of days. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd say within three to five days, right. probably. And then after that, maybe it gets a little more difficult. But kind of depends on the mom and the calf, though. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And there will be other opportunities. We've got a huge camera project coming up where we'll put trail cameras out. Um, hopefully we'll be starting that this summer. We're going to be putting out somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 trail cameras. And it's a new new effort to an effort to actually come up with some population estimates in region one where we can't survey because of the trees on um, you know, the aircraft. So that's a huge project. We're going to have a black bear DNA project coming up here. Uh, probably in our region, not this year, but next year. And then we've even got a few other things on the plate. So I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to maybe get engaged with the public and see if we can partner up and go in the woods and do some work together. So. Leo, just wanted, uh, what's the with the time frame among all the elk like the, that the calves are born? It's not on the same day for all of them. Just no, there's usually a pretty big pulse kind of right at the end of May, beginning of, of June. Okay. And that's when we'll probably schedule our capture operations. Uh, but yeah, we've seen it as early as mid May to you know, mid mid June, and sometimes even later. To okay. the yeah. Yeah. So it is a big window, but there's definitely a, a, a pulse in there where the most. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Did you check for uh, uh, pregnancy pregnancy rate on the captures? And it's kind of three questions. Um, is there any excess mortality since they're stressed in the next few days or week after the capture? And um, will you be able to determine uh, school births? Yeah, so, so and the usual. Yeah, so period. there's three questions there. So the first one, did we have any mortalities? We did have one calf that died in the trap. I talked to Kelly and she said it was in terrible condition and probably wasn't going to meet it, but it bounced around and I think it hit its head on the, the trap and it ended up dying. Um, so far, we've not had any other mortalities, um, but, you know, captures off the sleeve, like you said, be pretty stressful. Some of these animals are in pretty poor, poor shape, so we'll keep monitoring them. Um, hopefully we won't have any uh, anymore, but yeah, it, is, it is a potential cost of doing this kind of work. Um, preg testing, you, typically they would do check for a cat, a fetus, um, do rectal palpation, <laughs> just like a veterinarian would do for a for a cow, but uh, not all those elk were tested, but we do draw blood and we'll do blood tests on them. We rely on that for the pregnancy. So we'll get that information out. Um, and so we'll have a pretty good <coughs> pregnancy rates look like. And then what was the other one? Stillbirth. Stillbirth. Uh, will you be able to tell if they abort uh, between now and the first of June? You, if they push, push that implant out, yeah, it might give you a pretty good idea. Um, I don't know how much effort they're going to want to put into going and finding those because it's going to be pretty difficult. Um, but it might give you an idea that it could have happened. Um, you know, I used to do that, a lot of that work with brucellosis down in, in the Yellowstone area. And it's it's tough to find those sites and actually demonstrate it was a, a you know, stillborn fetus or abortion. But, um, you know, if those implants start coming out early, they could come out on their own, which doesn't occasionally happen. But, you know, if mom doesn't have a calf buyer at all, uh, you can kind of get an idea that maybe that happened. I think one thing, too, that's going to be happening on all these callers, I mean, they have different rates at which they're sending out signals, and it's not just a old VHF. This it's you know every several hours. And if we did get a mortality on one of these cows, I mean our tech guy, he's heading up in there to go yeah. find out why it died. Yeah, we're trying to look at cause specific mortality. So when we get a mortality, we go in and investigate it and try to determine what happened to that that animal. Neil is inclusive in that mortality uh testing. Are you doing like percentage fat off their off the rump and everything else to to get some sense for that both winter and and, and summer grazing activities and stuff. So we're gathering that information. 
Yep. Oh, yeah. That, that'll all be included. So, yeah, you want to know the condition of the animal when it died. Um, try to get any kind of health information you can on whatever's left, as well as trying to find out, you know, is it predation, uh, something else. So, so, yeah, there's a whole protocol that goes into there to try to address a lot of those things, uh, like you mentioned. Perfect. Yep. Cody? I was curious, Neil, you said two things <clears throat> in the discussion here that, that catch me. First, uh, the if I'm not mistaken, the regional biologist that's down there, a lady, maybe I can't remember. She's our research biologist. Research biologist. She mentioned that the elk were in really tough shape because of a difficult winter. Mm -hmm. And then you had a mortality on a calf in a trap right. and it was determined to be in very rough condition. Right. So Mike, I'm just curious, is the information gathered this year critical enough that it couldn't wait till next year on a better winter? So we're not stressing those animals. We're not yeah, well, eventually I mean, mortalizing those animals? The reality is you don't know until you start getting your hands on them. And so we didn't find this information out until we actually sure, got but, our hands on But here on. we are, right? So, right. We've only got like two weeks left of captures. Yeah. And most of the captures and those, the, those ground traps are happening on private property down in the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I haven't talked to find out if they're in a little bit better condition, but we're just about through that window. <clears throat> I mean, it does cause a little bit of stress, but you know, we caught mule deer on the mule deer project in one year, they were, we were all like, I don't know, this is, we're starting to look pretty tough here, but especially by the end of the winter, I was amazed at how many of those still pulled through. So, so yeah, it, it's a risk, um, you know, but the reality too is that this is actually a good year to get really good information because we're getting body fat indices from those elk. So they're doing conditioning indices on those elk as we're catching them. Okay. And so part of that is also try to understand how environmental factors uh, influence elk. So, so yeah, it's I, I hear you, and it, it's tough, and we don't want to kill any elk, um, but occasionally it, it does happen. Uh, but so far, it's in Auckland Wood, even though they're in tough shape, we haven't had a pulse of mortality. I think right now, you know, I've been here since '99, and I think we have more research stuff going on here this year and in the next few years that have to deal with like, you know, the big game species that a lot of the hunters are after, you know, with elk, mule deer, uh, and then the predation aspect of it, because it's always a, a hot button issue on what, what is causing these mortalities and stuff. And the camera studies, you know, that hopefully we'll actually get maybe some ways to actually get some legit counts in these heavy timbered areas. Mm -hmm. I know Kelly was talking about how difficult this terrain is. I mean, even, you know, you don't even just set the chopper down. You're like, you're jumping off of the edge of it to get to the ground. And it's, it's, it's a tricky business up there, what they're doing. And they are working hard to, to get it done. As you can imagine, 60 head elk and the effort to call or a bunch of calves just out on the ground. It's labor intensive. And boy, it'll be some, some awesome, uh, awesome information for us to chew on and, and hopefully figure some things out and hopefully then we're able to pull the right levers to uh, get something done you know with the results but uh, really neat times Neil is super busy and he better not retire anytime soon <laughs> so we got to get these pushed through at least not before me uh, okay anything yeah, yeah if anybody know? ever has any questions on what we're doing um, you please call we'll be glad to talk about it yeah, at some point, maybe I'll put something out to the only can push out to, to everybody about all the different projects that are going to be happening in, in Region 1 here in the next few years. And updates on this elk project, are, we have a website for that too, so I'll send that out in the follow-up notes. And this report's on there and all the other information, photos and videos are on there, so it'll be a good place to just follow this project. Any questions from the TV? Um. This is Pat. I did have a question, not for this one, but while we have Neil there, and if it's appropriately, if he could just chat a little bit about his, his meeting down in the swan about the white tails. He made reference to it in the report, and I think the whole CSC would benefit from just listening about that dialogue and the, and the different conversations and what came out, if you see it appropriate. Yeah, we'll give it a couple yeah. minutes before we move sure. on to Ian. Yep. Sure. Um, so we no secret, we've had a couple of really pretty mild years other than this one. Um, and typically when that happens, we start to see uh, whitetail, especially in whitetails, but all the other species as well, 
upon recruitment increases. So the number of animals that live through the winter, you know, becoming yearlings, um, we call those that a recruitment census. So uh, we do our spring counts. And typically we see an increase in, in survival. And so we have a higher, higher percentage of fawns per adult um, in those years. In the last few years, we've seen that. Um, and you can actually track that through the buck harvest, and, which is a pretty good indicator that you know, the population is actually increasing. Um, this last, I guess, is the last session. We actually kind of standardized seasons, and we put uh, an either sex season on the first week of uh, the general hunting season, pretty much everywhere in Region 1, except for think, the wilderness areas. And that included the swan, which we had closed earlier because of emergency closure, because populations took a dive after the winters of 16 and 17. Well, um, one of our former commissioners, Commissioner Wolf, um, sent a letter to, to Commissioner Tabor ask, asking, you know, could we maybe reverse that? And so he put us in contact with Commissioner Wolf and Ron Zingelfinger, the area bouts, and I went down and talked to Mr. Uh, Gary Wolf and a couple other folks down there that are really familiar with the area and have a long history of, of you know, kind of what's happened in the area. And we had a really good conversation. Uh, one of the things they talked a lot about, uh, quite a bit about, was the change in the habitat and some of the timber management practices, both on the Forest Service as well as corporate timber lands, and how they really think that influenced not only white tails, but mule deer and elk in that area. Um, but we're not seeing that same increase that we thought we might see in buck harvest there. So we're still kind of wondering what's going on. So I think we're going to take a pretty good look at that and decide whether we want to treat, do something with the, the antlerless harvest there, because that's what they're concerned about is, you know, in their view, the, the white tail population hasn't rebounded. And it's still pretty low in the swan. And we'd like to maybe lay off the, the female portion of that. And that's definitely something that's we're going to be taking a look at, maybe considering for this next season setting process. But it was really a, a good conversation with those guys. They've a lot of local knowledge, and they've seen a lot of changes on the landscape. You know, even some of the wetland stuff that these deer used to use, um, you know, it's all been invaded by <laughs> with, with weeds and stuff now. And, and, and here aren't even using it. So a lot of changes on the ground that need to be accounted for. It was a good discussion. What what I liked about that whole process, Neil, and, and, and the reason I wanted to bring it up tonight is I suspect all throughout the region, some of you have concerns about other target areas. And when you do take people that have kind of live and breathe a particular area and get really intimately familiar with it, they may provide insight, not always, you know, because these guys are pretty on their game and they know what they're doing. But having said that, having additional intel only gives them the opportunity to better be better wildlife managers. And so, although, you know, I, I was, I had the opportunity to maybe effectuate a change in the December meetings, like a mid-year change in between biennials, I talked pretty extensively to Neil and, and to Lee about it. And we elected to leave it just for the season, um, but you know, between now and working our way through the rest of this year, if you have concerns about districts and quotas and things like, I'm hearing a lot from people on lions that some of our quotas might not be high enough in certain areas because they're seeing a lot of lions and, and the quotas filled very quickly and they feel like they could have gone up a little bit. Now is the time to, to, to have these really valued in-depth conversations, in my opinion, because it gives staff adequate time to really contemplate a change, then get it into the system so we can have a meaningful biennial process next year. So, you know, I feel like that sounds like, Neil, you guys got some, some good fodder for consideration, and it probably will impact whatever recommendation you're going to come up for at least swan specific. And if there's other areas in the region we need to be doing that, boy, now's the time to reach out to Neil and his crew and get that done. Yeah, and as Commissioner Taylor said, we're starting a new process. We review regulations every two years. And so start from now into the summer, we're gonna be having lots of discussions about wildlife and, and the regulations and, and what we need to do to, if anything, to, to change things up a bit. And that'll be part of that mule deer discussion as well. That's why we're doing it. All right, thanks. Uh, so now we'll move uh, to our next topic on here, and uh, Ian's going to give us an update. He was picked to, uh, to be on the Citizen Advisory Committee for our Elk Management 
Um, I'll let him explain exactly what that is, but uh, we stole about four minutes of his thunder and we'll make up for it on the other end if we have to, because this is the portion, one of the portions of the meeting that the citizens advisors, uh, you know, pick and choose what they want to have. And this was an item that was brought to, uh, to Molly and uh, we want to make sure it gets vetted and we'll, we'll lay off of our stuff to make sure that this gets done and uh, he can give his discussion and we can answer questions. You guys can answer or ask him of any questions and stuff. But I think the, the project that Neil was talking about, you know, elk and uh, predators and all these different things all tie into in part habitat with what uh, Ian was part of. And uh, we'll just turn it over to him and however you want to <coughs> let her fly, we'll give you a half hour. And if you need more, we'll go more. Well, awesome. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, lucky enough to get selected uh, for the elk advisory uh, group that we had this this summer. It was, I guess, just um, there was a kind of an all call email that that went out for for applicants and type type things up. And um, I, I was I, I felt pretty lucky to get get selected. I feel like, you know, you know, guys in the Northwest and whatnot, we don't, you know, our, you know, issues are you are unique to the area and whatnot. And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of the air maybe gets taken out of the room with, you know, other issues across the state that are completely different. They're very valid, but they're different. Um, so I was, I was very lucky. Or I felt very lucky to get, get on the group. And it was a, it was a super positive experience, really. It was, it was pretty, you know, I went in, you, you know, pretty bristled up. I'm still bristled up, but uh, <laughs> I was, it, it was really encouraging to see how a lot of very, you know, very backgrounds and, and whatnot and um, opinions and whatnot, how we all, you know, we're all Montanans. We all got together around the table. We had incredibly good discussions, I felt like, you know, I mean, there was a lot of issues, you know, it was, it was really, I guess it was good for me because, you know, I'm super opinionated guy and, and I feel like, you know, the more, the more in-depth, long, long-winded discussions that you have, you know, the more, you know, you kind of gravitate towards the center on, on some issues and whatnot. And so it was, it was really good. It was, it was good to, for me to take the edge off on, on a few things and just see, you know, some of these other opinions. It was really helpful, you know, particularly, um, you know, I don't recreate a ton in other, uh, parts of the state that, you know, I like, I really like the Northwest, but, uh, you know, I mean, just really getting a partner in here, like, you know, some landowners, you know, perspectives and whatnot. And that, that was cool. It was really, it was really positive. Um, you know, I don't know that we, I think we just brushed the surface on a lot of things and we, you know, really uncovered that, you know, the issues are probably a lot more complex than we give it, you know, credit for, but um, I think we opened a lot of good, good doors and set the stage for, you know, some, some future discussions. So I mean, that's a quick rundown. I guess uh, I'm going to run through kind of the list of things that we we came up with, and I think if anybody wants to stop me along the way and have you know any um, extra questions or whatever, um, yeah, feel free to. Could you just remind me what was the main charge of the group? Was there a, was there a charge or was there just get together and talk? Oh, about you're putting else? me on the spot. It was it was. Uh, um, or they asked you for recommendations essentially, right? Was that kind of the basic? Yeah, I mean, it was, there wasn't really a lot of boundary. I'm, I'm going to do, uh, I should know, like I stared at this, this every day and, you know, but basically it was to um, just, you know, collaborative effort to, you know, address elk, elk issues. There was a big um, kind of emphasis on, you know, addressing kind of the elk over objective conundrum that we have in a lot of, a lot of areas in, in the state. I kind of took the group down a different path a few times, but, uh, um, yeah, just to, you know, I mean, kind of basically the director, I mean, he handed over to the department or, I mean, sorry, the microphone to the, you know, to the citizens and just said, what do you think? I mean, more, more or less in, in we, you know, we were guided down certain directions, but it was pretty, pretty open, um, you know, format and whatnot. And there wasn't any, um, it was, it was pretty much just led by members on the, on the group, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't like 
hey, here's your talking points or, or anything like that. It was very uh, member member driven. So yeah, anyway, um, yeah, go through the uh, list of recommendations and then uh, hopefully have enough time to just kind of talk about, you know, what I see, you know, everybody here from the Northwest and whatnot, what I see, you know, just some positive things that came out uh, regarding Northwest. Um, first recommendation, uh, Access Plus program. Um, this is just kind of, you know, a little bit of brainstorming to think of um, ideas outside the box to, you know, try to supplement the existing block management program. I think, you know, the people that are participating in the block management program, there's a lot of success there and don't really want to change anything that is, is working. But, you know, is there an opportunity to look at other um, other ways to, you know, particularly incentivize landowners or bring, you know, bring a crop of hunters that's maybe a little bit better trained, more respectful for the, uh, to the land uh, to, you know, basically unlock some, some, uh, you know, private lands that are getting shut down uh, to, to public hunting for, for a number of reasons. So um, yeah, just kind of a, an idea to try to like, uh, get more uh, public access. Uh, everybody's favorite here, choose your weapon slash season. Um, I guess this one really came about because everybody on the group hated hunters in Montana and they really wanted to stop hunting. No. Um, the, I guess the, the heart behind the choose your weapons recommendation was, I think there was a collective agreement and I would think people are, would have the same feelings that, you know, over the last few years, the quality of the experience has diminished in Montana. That's probably a lot of the reason why the group that, you know, the elk advisory group was created in the first place were that the hunting experience is diminished. I don't think there's a lot of people that would, you know, uh, say differently. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is the, we refer to it as like the nuclear option. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you improve the experience? Well, you can restrict access and, you know, so it was, it was thrown out there, you know, could this, could this be, you know, an option that we, that we look at, um, you know, I mean, I think it's something that maybe it'd be inevitable if, if no action is taken, but it sure seems like there's a lot of positive things maybe taking place or on the, on the front that could, uh, you know, improve game numbers and habitat quality and some other stuff so you know maybe this uh, maybe this doesn't need to be implemented for a while if we can get some other uh uh other you know things off the ground so oh I thought there was a question. um uh next one was uh collaboration between uh fwp forest service blm dr dnrc other uh land management agencies um this is just kind of to, to highlight that there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between, you know, this agency takes care of this, this agency takes care of that. Like, you know, they, they have, you know, lacking abilities to influence one another and just trying to highlight that, you know, hey, you know, the more collaboration that we get, the more roundtable discussions and whatnot, the more, you know, partnerships, team building, et cetera, you know, hopefully the better, better off everything's um gonna be uh create an a9 bundle tag uh this is kind of uh interesting you know different land you know landowner perspective you know how do you how do you actually address elk populations being being over objective how do you move the needle on on too many elk well you know land you know some landowner complaints where you you have a guy come in and the guy that the guy that has the skills and ability to successfully get it done and harvest some elk, he comes in with one tag in his pocket, harvests an elk, and and goes home. While you know, I mean, and when he has that opportunity, there's a bunch more sand around that you know he probably could harvest extras while he was there, but doesn't have another tag in his pocket. And then the guy that shows up with three tags in his pocket maybe doesn't have the skill set to even harvest one. So. Um, just trying to get, you know, basically if you buy one tag, you get three, um, to, 
to uh, you get three carcass tags to try to try to capitalize on you know when when it, uh, opportunities present themselves for uh, multiple take to try to move the needle on uh, elk harvest. Um, uh, user friend or develop more some user friendly and effective uh, methods for data collection. I mean, I think just you know the idea here was uh, the better the better data that we have, the you know the better decisions we're going to be having. I know you know there's a lot of discussion on. Uh, uh, potentially looking at, you know, some mandatory report, harvest reporting and other stuff, just so we, you know, we do have, you know, solid, reliable data. And, you know, maybe if we went down that route, you know, maybe it's not even, I think the biologists feel like, you know, you know, a lot of that data, you know, given their, you know, the history that we have uh, with the phone surveys and whatnot, that they know how to interpret it, but you know, there's the perception by the public that, hey, you know, or we're making decisions off of, you know, you know, maybe unreliable data. So a little bit of a um, suggestion there. Um, there's one to instruct or enforce stricter penalties for uh, trespass and other uh, bad behavior by uh, hunters and landowners. You know, I think this one goes without saying we you know, as, as a hunting community, we'll want to, we want to come across good to landowners and, you know, be self-regulating and, and make sure that, you know, if somebody does step out of line, that there is some repercussions. We also pointed out that, you know, I mean, there's, as landowner demographics and whatnot are changing in the state, there's a lot of, you know, folks that are maybe moving in and their realtor told them that, you know, they had full control of this county road or whatever and they put up a sign so you know is there some recourse there for a little bit of a given a given a take um on both sides this one i mean it seems like common sense no-brainer implementation you know there's a lot of a lot of caveats there it's it's come up multiple times in uh legislative sessions and whatnot and it's yeah I, i'd say it's a lot easier said than said than done in my in my opinion um establish uh, localized elk working groups. Um, it was kind of cool deal. It sounds like there was, uh, um, there's like a sweet grass uh, wildlife working group. And I think another one like devil's kitchen or some other, like some other successful kind of localized boots on the ground elk working groups. I mean, uh, you know, probably no different than going down the swan and talking to the guy where, you know, out his back door, he sees, you know, he sees things every day and has some unique insights. So trying to leverage, you know, local, local insights, I think it's a, you know, be a very positive thing. Um, expanding hunter education. Um, you know, I think that uh, the more, more well-educated uh, our hunting public is, the more, uh, you know, the, the less, uh, you know, the thought is hopefully the less uh, things that hunters do to give, you know, each other a bad name. And um, yeah, I, pretty, pretty self-explanatory there. I think, you know, there's some discussion with, you know, obviously the COVID stuff and whatnot and trying to, and I think there's even some legislation out right now to, uh, um, you know, bring back that in-person, you know, training and field days and and whatnot. Um, FWP uh, landowner liaison. Um, uh, I guess just you know, kind of talking about a need for a, a go between for uh, for landowners to kind of you know as they're working um, with the department and you know block management or whatever depredation issues, just have you know somebody that's a little bit. <clears throat> you know, more on call uh, to make, uh, make, you know, make contacts with landowners and keep that landowner relationship strong across the state. Um, improve accessibility uh, to FWP videos, programs, uh, uh, training, et cetera. Um, 
I'd say Dylan's doing a pretty good job with uh, taking the <laughs> bull by the horns on this one. I've really, I've really appreciated as of recent, you know, uh, uptick, and it just seems to me like there's been a lot better communication with the community, um, you know, in FWP. But you know, basically, you know, just continued improvement to the the website, and there's a lot of good, valuable um, training resources out there. I, I can't even remember what the what the name of the program was, but there was a um, program on FWP's website that, uh, um, you know, that kind of talks about that hunter landowner landowner stewardship program. Landowner stewardship program. There you go. But it, it's, it was very hidden, tucked away kind of in the Pretty bowels of the website. It kind of dated. So maybe, <laughs> maybe a update in that. Um, that is underway, by the way. That's cool. a great recommendation. Yeah. Um, promoting focused damage hunts. Um, this is, uh, I think there's, I can't remember what the other, yeah, promoting focused damage hunts and, um, kind of, you know, use of shoulder seasons. These, these two recommendations really, um, you know, kind of dovetail together and, you know, kind of our, our assessment was, you know, to go in and, you know, try to take more of that scalpel approach instead of the sledgehammer approach, um, you know, to, you know, just if possible, reduce, reduce elk populations on, you know, said ranch that's experiencing the depredation issues. And maybe, you know, especially there, you know, kind of an underlying theme with a lot of the, the comments that, uh, um, you know, that, some of the shoulder seasons were, you know, open to hunting on public land. And are we, are we maybe pushing the needle in the wrong direction by, you know, elk respond to pressure, I think is pretty well documented. So is that, is that public land pressure? Is that starting to create, um, you know, are we creating more of a problem, even though, you know, the numbers maybe get reduced, are we pushing more, more elk on to, uh, um, you know, private land through that. Uh, I guess the other, um, other thing, you know, with the damage hunts, I think there's, you know, they try to keep everything open, fair opportunity to participate in those. But then, you know, if I'm in Kalispell and you have a damage hunt in Ekalaka and I sign up for it or whatever, like, is it really practical for me to get there when the animals are, are there? So just kind of trying to look at that a little bit more and maybe, you know, put a little bit more, um, you know, emphasis on, you know, some of that local, local participation or trying to have kind of a, um, you know, integrate some folks in, but also have like a preferred kind of, uh, you know, priority list for folks, or even, you know, if you've had, you know, if you've built a relationship with a hunter and, you know, they're successful and they know your ranch, maybe, uh, um, be able to, you know, have that, you know, give preference to them, have them come back, et cetera. Um, uh, stakeholder meetings, this is kind of interesting one. Um, the guys in the group wanted to see, you know, just more round table discussion, stakeholder meetings, something, you know, similar to this, similar to what we had in the meeting, um, as actually they, they did a test run of this at the uh, MOGA conference in Helena here just a little while back. And it was actually, I thought it was incredibly cool. I sat in on it. I wasn't, I didn't participate in it, but I, but I listened in and it was really cool to see a bunch of, you know, Stock Growers Association, Farm Bureau, Bow Hunters Association, MWF, BHA. I mean, all these folks sitting around a table and, you know, I mean, discussing, discussing issues, the same folks that, you know, at, prior legislative sessions, like basically had a, each, everybody in a stranglehold, you know, I mean, we're at each other and it was just cool to see a little bit of team building and, you know, people acting like, you know, Montanans first and foremost. So that was a, that was a cool concept. Cool. Cool to see that, uh, get put into play already. And, uh, I think there's some, uh, probably, uh, circle back to that one in a little bit, but, uh, yeah, it was cool to see, see that, um, take place. It was one to you know understand and mitigate uh, disease uh, and brucellosis in elk. Uh, interesting perspective. Obviously, it's 
Bruce Lewis is pretty foreign to me uh, being up in the Northwest, but it, you know, for, for some uh, cattle producers and whatnot, it's a, it's a pretty big issue. I don't know that there's any clear cut uh, answers here, but uh, definitely, definitely something that we, you know, don't need to, or, uh, you know, I, I guess my opinion's probably changed on, on this one quite a bit, you know, you, uh, you know, as we're seeing development in the state and whatnot, you know, probably the thing that got, got, got to me is, uh, you know, it's easy to be like, well, you know, the elk's more important than your cattle or whatever. And then you, you hear from the landowner or whatnot and you realize that, well, maybe what's the alternative, the alternative, you know, there's plenty of people that would be more than happy to buy a chunk off of that ranch and, you know, build a condo there or whatever. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I got a little bit more, you know, a little bit of empathy for that one. And, you know, think that, uh, yeah, it was good to, good to get brought up. Um, and then last one, uh, yeah. Manage up where they're not. This was kind of like my little, uh, pet project that probably raised some eyebrows, uh, just trying to, uh, shed light on, on the Northwest and, uh, you know, kind of the unique issues that, that we face, in the, you know, in our area, you know, it's, you know, it's pretty envious of the folks in the, in the group that just, you know, their issues were too many elk, too many elk, too many elk. And it was just like, I, you know, I think we probably all long for, you know, the problem of too many elk, you know, and, uh, you know, just trying to point out that, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm pretty convinced that, uh, you know, some of the, elk distribution issues that we're facing in the rest of the state with, uh, um, you know, elk leaving our public grounds and preferentially selecting uh, private property, you know, maybe, maybe there's a stronger correlation to that or, you know, to what's going on in the Northwest that, you know, that might be causing, causing some of that. You consider that we have half of the public land your forest service property in northwest montana we have a third of the population and yet if you want to fill an elk tag you're typically not hanging around the northwest to do it you're you're traveling elsewhere so we're we're you know not only are there more hunters more non-residents etc on the landscape we're also you know now we're distributing a lot of our uh, hunters from the northwest on the other other parts of the state and just increasing that pressure and elk are smart they respond to pressure so you know i think we're seeing more and more in addition to you know landowner demographics changing that are okay with elk being on their property um that yeah we're just seeing yeah um kind of trickle down impacts in my opinion on on the rest of the state uh kind of due to uh you know diminished elk herds in Northwest Montana, um, I guess that was kind of rifling through. I don't know if anybody has any pointed specific questions at. Yeah, if, if anybody did have some specific to it, I mean, he was, he was in the trenches, you know, digging through all this stuff and I got to commend him because he was one of, well, the only one who had a problem other than too many elk. And he did his best to get that point across to others, but be part of the conversation as well on dealing with other things. You aren't going to find anybody, no disrespect to anybody else here, probably more engaged in elk and deer, et cetera, than, than Ian is right now in Northwest Montana, trying to facilitate some change out there. I think he's he's getting after it. And I know one thing I touched for already that we, we had go on and maybe touch on this and then we'll get to the group, but I think recently you talked about coordination with different agencies and folks, and I know our biologist Franz has been working pretty close with you. You guys had some good discussions recently, maybe with the Forest Service. Maybe you could touch on that. Yeah, no, that was you know kind of like the stakeholder meeting, um, you know, concept. I think it played you know pretty heavily into this one. And I mean, obviously, I you know I threw some punches on you know I didn't feel like there was you know good you know good enough coordination, be, you know, interagency coordination taking place and whatnot. And uh, I think it's pretty encouraging right now. I think, I think we're, you know, there's, there's been a lot of 
inactivity that's taken place. And I mean, it, it, there's a there's a multitude of things. I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, Equal Access to Justice Act be a great thing, but it's also, you know, really uh, probably stopped up a lot of, um, you know, well-intentioned projects and whatnot, um, you know, just through litigation and, and whatnot. And Forest Service is, for kind of a long time, it seems like they've been, or quite a few years, their hands have kind of been tied. And just, just as of recent, there's been a few, you know, they've, they're getting some, Corey could probably talk to this more, but they're starting to get some projects off the ground, some, th some actual boots on the ground projects, habitat, well, I mean, their forestry management projects, I call them habitat enhancement in the Northwest because we need some sunlight to hit the ground to grow some food. But um, there's, we're starting to see some, some positive things take place. And then, um, yeah, so through some of my incessant pestering and whatnot that um, talking to the Forest Service and whatnot, they're it's pretty cool right now. I'm pretty excited. There's, um, there's some recent funding opportunities that have come down through uh, some uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Great American Outdoors Act. Um, so the, the Forest Service, like just bipartisan infrastructure law alone, there's been 2.42 billion allocated to the Forest Service, as is nationwide, but for fuels reduction. So fuels reduction money, that kind of allows the Forest Service to maybe paint outside the lines a little bit on what is typical for, um, forestry management projects because first and foremost the the forest service even though it might not seem like it they're a timber production you know organization habitat while it's a strong component it maybe is not the strongest component so um sounds like i mean nothing's nothing set in stone yet but uh, had actually just yesterday had a really positive meeting with uh, yeah Franz and um, some of the Forest Service biologists and uh, uh, their fire specialist and whatnot kind of looking at uh, uh, well this was the the spotted bear district ranger uh, an area that I'm pretty passionate about and uh, area where I recreate a lot and uh, um, yeah it's pretty uh, pretty exciting uh, meeting uh, kind of looking at into you know some some areas that uh, we could do some targeted, uh, you know, fuels reduction, habitat enhancement, maybe do some enhancement on some winter ranges and, and whatnot, and kind of, you know, get a collective uh, uh, project going that, you know, really has been pretty absent from the landscape for the last, say, 20 plus 30 years, you know. So um, that was that's pretty exciting and kind of more to more to come on that as that develops I, you know, I'd sure like, you know, from, from this group, um, you know, if anybody's interested in supporting that and trying to, you know, um, add input and, you know, push, push that along and be, uh, it'd be pretty appreciated. Um, I definitely, um, through just kind of happen through, you know, being involved in the, advisory group for the elk there was a lot we got a lot of comments in from you know different larger organizations the bhas mwf you know bow hunters association i don't know uh sportsman fish and wildlife i don't know a bunch of a bunch of organizations that seem to have you know we can we can all bicker about this that or the other but i think everybody can agree that healthier habitats and whatnot they, i mean they it's it's going to be positive for for everybody that has an interest in the landscape. I mean, the more the healthier our our landscapes are, the more animals we grow, the more opportunity there is for everybody. So, um, kind of hoping that uh, there kind of be a collaborative push to you know support the Forest Service in in some of these uh, potential projects and kind of capitalize on you know some. Uh, what what's kind of one-time funding right now but you know if there's a lot of positive outcomes hopefully i mean this is this is dreaming but hopefully there there's uh you know we can show positive out outcomes through active management that you know 
um, you know, we could set up, you know, kind of more reoccurring revenue streams through that and whatnot. Cause um, I mean, I think we could all, all agree our, our wildlife has a lot of value. So. Eric, did you have a question? I was just going to ask what, uh, were these, any of these specific recommendations you made to the department or were they were just kind of conclusions from the discussion or is there still ongoing the, work to direct recommendations to this? So, um, and these guys might be able to uh, jump in a little bit. So we came up with the recommendations. These are, we recommendations. Found, these, are recommend, these are recommendations from our group. We gave them to the department. The department looked at them did their review analysis on them. Then each recommendation was put out to the public. There's a public comment period on, on each recommendation. And I think we're still in the kind of sorting through process, you know, I guess looking at, you know, hey, if everybody, you know, every comment we see is, you know, is positive on, on this, whatever, you know, hey, this is something that we probably should, um, focus our efforts on. I don't, I don't, there's, there hasn't been any like department action on, on any items yet. And we don't have any regulatory authority or anything. So, so there were two well working groups. There's a working group before when the even was on in this one. Okay. And so all those recommendations and, and the commission saw some of the justifications for the, the first group, they're all sitting kind of out there and hopefully can be incorporated as much as possible in the health plan that we're working on and that's where a lot of this stuff will hopefully mm -hmm. show up but there's also some of these that require you know, legislative action which is beyond the department so those are things that wouldn't be there so yeah it's still in the works it just always takes longer than you know was was like just it. clarifying that those were all recommendations yeah yeah, yeah. i got one comment i think it's it's this elk study that um you know, down in that Knoxon country is a good opportunity. And I, you mentioned it, I think it's worth mentioning that to look at the Forest Services management plans there and see how that, you know, it's, it's timely, I think. Because not everything the Forest Service uh, proposes is necessarily supported by the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, or it may, you know, the impacts aren't, it's, uh, it, it's it, there's a relationship there that, you, you know, I, I would assume that the FWP has opportunity to comment on projects and they're not always necessarily beneficial. So the more studying we have and, yeah. you know, to substantiate or, or not, I think it's important. I think it's pretty cool. Tying it back into what Ian's, you know, speaking of. I think there's, a, there's probably a lot more conversations between us and the Forest Service when people realize we don't do a very good job of telling people that we're doing that. And most of the time our biologists are working with theirs to before a project even gets to the scoping period about things that we might be able to do. And yeah, then we're always weighing winter range versus summer habitat. So there's a lot of things that go into it. But yeah, it's, I think having a forester on our staff has really helped me kind of understand how we might be able to achieve what forest management and wildlife goals a little bit better. So the kind of conversations Ian's talked about are the ones I'm hoping that we can have across the region with Forest Service, maybe with multiple axes. But Neil, is there there's a forester here or there's a forester in Helena? Statewide forester who, who helps us manage all of our wildlife our properties and I think he's even worked with parks. So great guy, very knowledgeable. He worked with the NRC before. Yeah. Um, but it, it's it's we have some really good conversations about what we want the WME to work to look like and how we want it to function. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think what we can do, if there aren't any other questions now, we can move to the portion of the agenda for uh, Stephanie to talk about our uh, shooting ranges. And then if you think of something after that, and we'll see how the time flows, but then if you have something more that we can discuss with Ian, we can do it then before we do a round table with everybody um, that has any issues to potentially bring up. But I think Stephanie's got a fairly quick uh, presentation on some pretty cool stuff that's moving, uh, hopefully shooting range near you. Hi. Uh, I've 
I'm Stephanie Brown. I'm the Access and Landowner Relations Bureau Chief. And I'm based out of Helena, but live here in Region 1, which I think is the best So Very excited that I can come and be here to share a little bit about this bureau. It is a fairly new bureau and was developed about a year and a half ago. And uh, we have four major areas that I'm working with. One is our hunting access program. So Macy is your local regional access manager. I also work closely with our um, state funded trail stewardship grant program and all of our off highway um, OHV programs. And then also part of that is a shooting range grant program. But what's very exciting that I'm here to talk about tonight is share information about a new program and it's the shooting range development program. It's different than the shooting range grant program the grant program has been around for a very long time and has um, helped facilitate a variety of different range development projects to support local clubs and sportsmen's groups throughout the state. The shooting range development program is a new program with the overarching goal of developing FWP administered shooting range facilities. So we'll start developing these facilities hopefully within the next two years and throughout the next 20 years throughout the entire state. So that's the big overarching goal. And then some of those objectives that just really feed into that in, and the why behind that is wanting to provide new and expanded access for folks and places where people can go and, and, and shoot recreationally, whether it's firearms or archery, and then, of course, within firearms, the whole range of, of types of firearms. Uh, the other big piece is to resolve concerns that arise from folks going out and shooting on public lands that are not organized facilities. So that lead mitigation and some of the waste that is left behind. So trying to get people off of those unorganized or undeveloped areas and into more developed areas. Um, let's see here. Also having a really solid focus on education. So providing opportunities for people to learn, whether it's youth or adults or families or clubs or groups. So really, really growing that education piece throughout the state. I don't have my glasses on and it's late. So my eyes are starting to fade. Here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I actually might. No, those are a little too strong. As we're working to develop these sites, the, the goal is really to develop one new facility within each major population area in the state. So when you think of the Kalispell, Whitefish, Columbia Falls area, we are looking to develop one of these new facilities within an hour of, of here. So these that's- outdoor facilities or indoor facilities? This is such a brand new program that skies are open and skies are, are the limit here, which is very exciting. Free um, or fee? What's that? Free or fee? They are going to be FWP administered. They are going to be accessible. So there, there's likely going to be a fee, but it's not going to be membership based. So we, the main goal is to ensure that they are accessible for all. And day use kind of thing. Day use, oh, yep. Okay. yep. Um, and then the last piece is developing a, a real like flagship facility. If you're into shooting now and have been to any of these larger facilities in other states, Arizona has one. That's kind of the, the classic that everybody refers to. It's the Ben Avery shooting complex. It's about 2,000 acres and, and looking to develop one of these premier facilities here in the state of Montana as well. Uh, so really to kick all of this off, what we're doing is some statewide scoping and uh, we hired a shooting range development program manager. His name is Samuel Hoggett. He's based out of Helena as well. So what he and I are doing is we're going around to all of the CAC meetings this spring, just to give this high level overview. It's a brand new program. And to share that we are starting just this real high level statewide scoping, just to be able to develop a guiding document, a strategic plan to help guide these efforts over the next few years. Uh, 
part of that is me coming here tonight. We're also developing a stakeholders group that was made up of statewide residents with a variety of different backgrounds and interests. We're developing an internal working group made up of FWP staff with representation from game wardens to front desk staff. So we're all in this together and really wanting to get a lot of feedback. We'll be doing a statewide scoping survey. It's gonna be a very simple online survey that folks can go on, fill out. It hopefully won't take more than five minutes just to really get feedback. What are people excited about? What are people concerned about? What are some ideas that people may have? Again, attending these meetings just to give this high level overview. But then what you'll see here, hopefully in the next two weeks, I'll work with Dylan to get a more pointed survey out to CAC members. So um, you can give even more feedback along the way. And then um, we'll also be doing some VIP interviews with folks that may not be able to participate in a strategic plan or attend a meeting. So we just can have some of those one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks as well. So then really after we have our guiding document in place, then we'll start narrowing it down on, on where are we going to start first? Where are some of these areas that have high need? And then we'll be coming back out into the regions and doing some real site specific work and working with local communities to really get some feedback, more detailed feedback that's more pertinent to the region or area. So this is starting with just acquire a piece of land or have you thought about taking existing facilities, partnering up with them to really you know, enhance them with, a, you know, obviously some FWP ownership. Yeah, sky's the limit. Uh, what you're describing is very similar to what the state of Arizona does. They have their flagship premier facility, and then they own several facilities throughout the state, partner with local clubs to manage them. So that may be an option to look at. The intention is not to come into any area and um, take anything over or compete with a local club at all. That's definitely not the intention. We would be looking for ways to partner to enhance each other's areas. And the only reason I asked that is because I don't know how many of you have been to the Libby Range in the last two years, but we have done ex extreme work up there with the ultimate overarching goal of having something that's unlike anything in the state. Yeah. So we're not only handling big bore rifle competitive pistol, but we just got our fourth trap range and two uh, skeet ranges. So we are now officially ATA American, uh, yeah, Trap Association authorized to run full blown two day events up there. And we literally just got that. So, I mean, and we have archery range, both fixed and areas to put up, uh, you know, 3D ranges. And I just wondered, I mean, the goal is in all seriousness, we got six full size, 16 foot burn, 500 yard, 200 yard, 60, 80 yards. So it's, it's, it's going to be world-class literally. Sounds it. And, and, but obviously, you know, we're looking to have some people partner to assist with, you know, the covers and different things. But I mean, it's, if you haven't been there, you'll be stunned when you roll into that parking lot. And it's 100% free. Oh, wow. I think 100% free. And the goal is to keep it 100% free. That's great. Um, Ooh, sounds that's like it. it's, it's, for, it's, it's US Forest Service land with a long term, I don't know how many year, mega year contract with Lincoln County. So, Lincoln County is the, it, it's an official county park, it's how we legally run that. And then the Libby Rod and Gun Club is tasked to the to run it for Lincoln County as a park. So, and it's got you know we got the multi million dollar you know the policies we've built a giant clubhouse up there. Yeah, that's getting expanded greatly. I mean, it's it's going to be a it already is a big deal, but it's the best in the state in all seriousness. And uh, it's going on past that. But that's the kind of thing I thought you know if somebody's saying look. We want to, you know, we'll spend a hundred grand and and really expand this. We're, we want to have an indoor small bore uh, building that's kind of next on our list and things like that that you know FWP can come in and partner up and uh, 
Funding yeah, the funding source is through Pittman Robertson funding. So anytime you're purchasing firearms or ammunition, it's taxed, it goes to Pittman Robertson, they're redispersing that throughout all of the states. And what the state of Montana is doing is really giving back to the folks that are purchasing that ammunition and firearms by developing these sites. It's around 80% of folks that are purchasing are recreational shooters. They're not necessarily hunters. So really just looking at ways to support and, and give back and provide educational opportunities as well. I'd love to come up and visit. Yeah, we're only 90 minutes from Galesville. Yeah, I need to come visit. I'm pretty sure my great uncle is probably there quite often. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's in the last two years, I mean, and, and everything is built to the, NRA, uh, their engineers gave us all the input. So when the county literally came out there and built those berms that are 16 feet across the top and they're 16, 18 feet, whatever the number is, tall, and they run the entire length of, of each of the, the bays, five, five complete bays, and then a sixth one that sets off to the side. I mean, it's, it's all built to spec, official yeah. you know, spec. So awesome. for containment, noise mitigation, the whole nine yards, so. And Stephanie, is, is one thing cool. that would be available to the Rod and Gun Club, and I don't know if you guys have applied for anything, but is the, the existing grant side that we've had for quite a while. And I don't know, does that have more money in it than it used to, or is that still the same? It's still the same, and that requires a 50-50 match. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that we've yeah. funded we've projects. Yeah. 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 And um, so that's still existing. Yeah. But you know, this is a great example of where we should be finding ways to work yeah. together. And I think that. Well, and the county is 100% behind it. In fact, our road crew was specifically directed whenever they were doing some major road product projects and they're bulldozing out dirt, it didn't get dumped in Farmer John's wherever or hauled a million miles away. Every bit of it, they turned it into a mountain out there at our, at our, our range. And then in the wintertime, when the road crews weren't plowing, they would move their equipment out there. And literally the county road crews built those. And like I said, if you see photos, it's impressive. Um, they built all that using county uh, county equipment, some community donations of, of special things. You know, we have, we've got the whole cement baselines down there. We had local businesses build us the big steel platforms for the shooting benches, literally all the way down the, the baseline of each of those. And, you know, we're looking for people to help us build the uh, the covers, you know, just uh, the lean-to type covers over the tops of them. But it's, uh, the county's 100% behind it. So, you know, they're they're a governmental partner, yeah. not just, you know, Billy Bob's, you know, rifle club out there that may or may not exist next year, you know, so. Sure. if that like gave anybody comfort positive relationship yeah yeah yeah. There. yeah well i'm just saying that you know it's 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 all above board it's not we're just trying to get by and you know we got a five-year lease from some rancher to let a shoot out there yeah you know it's uh there's there's been a, a an impact study done on everything out there you know every bit of signage every bit of access you know all the rules are from the feds on down i would love to come to her well, yeah. we'll give to a tour okay mm -hmm. And, and Stephanie, wait, some of that survey, what I recall when I looked at it real briefly, and I think a lot of the folks here. That's a little out. different, that survey that you're thinking okay, of. Okay, that but, one's different. Mm -hmm. Will they have that opportunity to provide the input on possible? Um, at some point, this group will. Yeah. So we're also doing an internal uh, mapping survey just to really identify any real visible gaps and ranges throughout the state right now. Um, and then when we do our our CAC follow-up survey, you'll have the opportunity to weigh in on any locations that you think may um, be desirable or any locations that you've noticed that are concerning if you're out recreating and know where there is um, somewhere that we need to address. Leo Anderson, we need to give him a call. Okay. He's like super uh, involved long range shooter, whatever. Um, I mean, for picking out places locally, it, that's going to be a heavy lift to find one around Kalispell because we're, before you run out of 
of residences. No. It's it's a way it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be the most problematic place in the state. To... One of them. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any other questions or hear any feedback tonight. Um, like I said, we'll be following up with a survey here in a couple weeks, and uh, I'm absolutely available for any sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation as well. I'm curious to know how many people here consider themselves a recreational shooter and aren't just out sighting in their rifle. Yeah. I'm surprised that it was 80 20. I may have that it's slightly wrong, but that was what I recall. Yeah. yeah. I do know there was a, a, a surge in recreational shooting, which resulted in some special grants going out to state. Um, wildlife agencies for shooting ranges. So mm -hmm. typically a PR grant is 20 match or 75, 20, so I'm gonna help you out or 75, 25. And these were 90, 10. Right, this falls that's under- how we updated our archery ranges at Lone Pine and are building one if they run. Yeah, Dave, just to touch on that too, I think that, you know, this is a new program, but there's been a lot in the works over the last couple of years that feed into this program that, have happened, especially here in uh, Region 1, and that is the archery expansion at Lone Pine and then the new range that's in the process of being developed at Big, Big Arm. So this isn't limited to just firearms. We're also expanding archery opportunities throughout the state. So we have the two here in Region 1 and then also at Makoshika State Park redeveloping. They have an archery course and we're expanding that as well. That will happen this summer. And just because I had one person comment here, just when I say it's it's free, it is, but it, the gate is not open. What it is, okay. is you're required to, and, and it's open certain times for the trap clubs out there. You go out, you have to sign a acknowledgement of the rules because there is official range rules that we had to have approved to get our permits. And you sign that and you are issued a personal gate code because we have a keypad, punch button, you know, electronic gate out there. So once you have that, it, but it also has a logger on it so we know who's in and who's out. Um, and then, but it's free. Everything is free. You just have to go out there and sign that waiver, sign that acknowledgement of rules, sign that if I bring somebody with me, I hold him to the same rules, you know, and I'm responsible for him while he's there. So, so but, is there a contact person to get that code? That well, yes. If you, during the, on Saturdays, uh, Wednesdays, uh, I think it's 10 to 2, and Saturdays, the thing, like eight to two or three, the gate is open and you can go to the clubhouse there because there are, are people from the club there that will give you the paperwork, sign you up and give you a, a number. Yeah. And that's an individual number for each person? It is, yeah. You have your number, I have my number. And uh, yeah, so it's like a <coughs> way we can log and track who's coming in, who's coming out, if something happened and say, hey, you know, well, somebody shot the back out of the you know, bathrooms or whatever, <coughs> you know, so. Uh, and we've, we're, we've got range officers or certified range officers that are kind of floating out there. We have uh, a little <coughs> master booth they built, kind of one of those little 1-800 looking sheds that uh, sits out there in the lot. So, I mean, it's big things coming, you know, but uh, like I said, you walk out there and it's many acres of flat as a billiard table parking area so we can move in a lot of stuff to have some big shoots out there. <coughs> <in the land. coughs> some PRS Rifle and shotgun and whatnot. What's that? You're going to do like some PRS type of stuff? And you know, if, if clubs want it, or people or people spearhead it, yeah, I mean, we're, we're at the point of getting to uh, say, hey, come on out here and, and, and run it. Awesome. Yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of groups been coming to the Valley, uh, Polson, Big Fork, uh, you know, some of these Warrior Poet Society and yep. some of these tactical yep. driven groups that really like using these bigger ranges for, you know, some DMR shoots for yep. pistol carbine. Yep. Uh, drills, stuff like that. And, those and, guys and we could have five of those running at the same time, literally, yeah. and they all have the same baseline. So if this is the parking lot, they're all, you know, going off this way. Awesome. So you can literally cruise the baseline in a car or on foot and, uh, you know, a couple hundred yards from here to the other end. But uh, our furthest, I think, is, is 500 with the potential we may, if the Forest Service lets us, because we've got a mountain behind us, literally push it on back a little way. So it's 500 now is the max. Awesome. So, but that's pretty good. I can't see past about 90, but <laughs> <laughs> it's cool.
rule that you actually have yes. to yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, she would need, yeah, yeah. Let's use Dave's glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. They even come, they even come apart and get opportunities. Yeah. We're looking at um, opportunities throughout the entire state, so likely one um, range within. And, I'm sorry, a range within an hour of every major population area. So we have a monster funding budget. Then. Oh. So it's all, it's through PR funding. Yeah, there's oh. been a big push in like allocation of PR dollars because of the discussion of this. So much money is spent on recreational shooting, but a lot of PR dollars are spent on hunting and wildlife, but a lot of money is generated from Plinking and you know recreational shooting, and so they're trying to funnel some of that money back towards recreational shooters, not just all towards bullets. And that match breakdown, so the agency does have to contribute a certain percentage mm -hmm. of match dollars towards this development. And like Dave was saying, they the way that PR funding works. I don't know what it is that traditional match, but when it comes to education, that's where these the range funding has fallen under. So I believe it's a 90 10. 90 10, and then Neil was saying 75 25. So yeah. Yeah. But it, it doesn't, it has to be non federal. <coughs> we actually yeah. can use private, private money to help match PR. We have to match but usually it's licensed dollars that the department is using to match. The archery range is the parks. Just to clarify, so it could be an archery range here, a pistol range here, a general use range somewhere else, like that. Clubhouses potentially, hunter education, health, and these you know, you know, who knows? We'll see where it ends out. You want to keep the sky's the limit, like she says, but you do a lot of planning to focus it down, and then you, you see what you actually can get, you know, in the end. But you really want to have some nice facilities for the public to use for a little to nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right here in the Flathead, you guys all probably know then that it's tough right now. Our clubs are packed. I mean, yeah, I've heard from the calls. Yeah, they're waiting. Done. List. There's a waiting list. There's a waiting list. I heard Big Forks either got one or is coming. Yep. And then Whitefish is dealing with it. The gun, the shotgun club up here at the dump is like the largest shotgun club in the West. If you're not there early, you're not going to find it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's a huge. Yeah. Sea Falls is a 600 limit, and I called randomly the day of them redoing uh, memberships and got a spot, but he said I was one of three that were available. Wow. So of everybody that had joined that club, 597 redid their membership. So they maxed it 600. <laughs> that's right now, and as this valley keeps growing, that's going to just keep getting worse and worse. And so for... Well, a lot of reasons. It's a, I think hunter recruitment, hunter training is so important. So I'm just going to be quiet and forget we had this conversation and we'll just stay nice and quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> be careful what you wish. For it, right? <laughs> Build it, they will come. Yeah, you don't have a seven many, plate fee yet. What's that? You don't have a seven. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a seven plate surcharge. Did you ask for a donation? You didn't say it was only 90 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is your established capacity for like for planning? I mean, do you guys have that? Is that a conversation? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have one at this point because it's never ever become an issue. Yeah. You know, but uh, like I said, they. We can run a lot of people through there. You know, they're talking about having 200 people for trap shoots, you know, and obviously the ranges are completely separate. But, yeah. Yeah. Have you had good success with uh, people respecting the facility? We have, and and we have a, uh, a caretaker that lives out there uh, on the, they, it, it's just a mobile couple in a mobile home out there, but since the county administers it, we give them, obviously free land and, and uh, electric and sewer and water. So they live uh, rent free. Wow. And so that's just their uh, pay is essentially that they, uh, or their rent is essentially that they'll go out there and just kind of stroll around, just having a presence there as for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years has just stopped a lot of the crap. 
and it, you know that people aren't dragging freaking TVs and trash cans and start you know garbage out there to blast away. They're using our nice backboards, which we ain't gone out of our way to build. We have tons of conveyor belt that we get from the mines. That uh, so we got the rubber backing and all that. And, uh, it's pretty pretty cool, but there's no nonsense. Hours are very closely regulated, and like I said, you have to sign the rules and around the gate code. So, anything else, Stephanie? No, um, I'll follow up with Dylan with that survey that I mentioned. And if anyone wants to talk prior to that being sent, um, Dylan can get you my contact info. As yeah, well. put it in tomorrow's follow up email. Yeah. So, just thank you for your time. And um, I'm really excited about this and, and what it's going to bring to the state. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch happen over the next several years. Great. Thanks, yeah. Stephanie. Thank you. Well, the next thing on the agenda would be a round table. Um, so I think we'll just start. We'll go through any of the members. If you've got something, great. If you don't, then that's fine too. Um, and then if we have time at the end, we can do the do the stew approach, if you will. Or throw anything else you want, and we can see what we can come up with for an answer. But uh, yeah, let's just go around. We'll start with you, Mark. If you've got any topics of discussion uh, you want to hit us with, okay. Uh, I just have a couple of small points, nothing earth shattering, but. One of the last meetings when the legislators were here, we were talking about the out-of-state tags and in-state tags. A lot of people were upset with the, the out-of-staters. We talked about reducing the number of tags for the out-of-state and raising the price on the in-state tags as a way to offset the cost. But I kind of thought later, well, if there's this high demand for these out-of-state tags, why don't you just reduce the number of out-of-state tags and raise the price on the out-of-state tags? And then keep the price of the in-state tag the same so if you're worried about upsetting all the locals and the, the in-state or so that was just a small point i thought later on and thought i'd bring it up i think mark on that one thing i don't have the specifics on the bills that are in the legislature but i can tell you that that non-resident resident dynamic is is a topic up on the hill um and one thing i was going to offer up and i'll talk with molly on this afterwards but we put together a a uh, presentation that went across the street to the legislature on licensing, you know, because we have what's perceived going on out there with license sales, and then we have the actual numbers that's going on, and and it really breaks down um, exactly what we've seen over the, over time on the number of non-resident license sales, the types of those sales, and and I was going to talk to her, and I'd offer it up to you guys for us maybe at a, the next meeting to. To go over that and show you what what we pulled out of our license sale thing is pretty interesting. I think it it tracks somewhat with what people are seeing. Maybe not quite as magnified, but there are definitely more licenses out there on the landscape uh, by non-residents um, for various reasons. But I think it'd be a, a good topic. But I'll I'll work that over with with Molly and see if that's something we could put on our, our part of the agenda, but it, it is a discussion, but those types of things are legislatively mandated, you know, those types right, of changes right. with prices and numbers and, and, and uh, standard percentages, whatever, would be a legislative uh, mandate, but uh, we'll have some updates maybe on those as well as the session moves on. Next Friday is the transmittal date for the legislature, and that's when all these bills need to be transmitted um, unless they have a funding, I think, arm to them that those can come in later. But so a lot of, a lot of stuff's happening here in the next week and a half. And uh, we'll see what uh, some of those bills may or may not be, um, but we can try to get you an update on the specific ones for licenses too. So I'll make sure we commit to that. Uh, I'll just, once again, reiterate my, I suppose, disappointment in the fact that none of the marijuana tax money went to parks. Uh, when you look at the House Bill 7, and this is nothing that can be done, you know, uh, again, by the legislators who should have, should, have, should be involved in anything here, but supposedly 4% of the revenue should have gone to state parks up to 650,000 um, bucks. And I hear us talk about how 
we're having a hard time funding FASs, you know, like, I don't know, four years now, five years. But here's like a chip shot to get some money to throw at trails, to throw at parks. And I don't know, I'm just a little disappointed that state government decided that FWP didn't need any of that money. So I don't know, that's all I wanted to say about that. What was the house bill on that? I think it was 701. And it should have given up to 4% of revenues to state parks, trails, recreation facilities, and wildlife protection, up to 600,000 bucks as much. I think FWP got none of that money. So right now, House Bill 669 is in play. Uh, might want to comment on that one. They're looking at, there was 20% that was through the ballot initiative that was allocated to Habitat Montana. And they're looking at pulling that 20% to go into the general fund or I don't right. know. Yeah. I, I'm, I did hear from a legislator that they promised that marijuana funding, like it's, it's like 10 times allocated. They promised, you know, 4% here and 10% there and 20% there. Right. And they, they, they're working off of about a thousand percent right now or something. So I don't know. That's just what I heard, but commenting on, you know, it's not parks, but it's Habitat Montana. It's something, you know. Yeah. And something. wildlife is one of the, one of the things on the list that I was referencing here as well. So just a general third voice to the ether. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <Yeah. laughs> Stay tuned on where that ends up in the end. That, that, that'll be the kicker on what exactly ends up going where and what percentage we're, we're tracking that for. Well, um, yeah, I was going to encourage Commissioner Tabor to uh, Bird Dog HB 573, submitted by Josh Kassmeyer, Fort Benton. Um, this is related to the Montana Community Service Act. Uh, a little bit of red tape that prevents state agencies from working with groups like AmeriCorps. And, you know, full disclosure, we run a lot of AmeriCorps members through the Conservation Corps. Um, but in terms of how they can contract and uh, what, what amount of money they can spend without putting it out to bid. <clears throat> and uh, so that cap right now is at $12,500 for a particular project. Costs are rising for everything. It's hard to get a crew out on the ground for, you know, two weeks with uh, with that kind of cap. It's been raised once before, and it's uh, now the, the idea is to um, to raise it further uh, or to uh, take it away altogether. So if you're into reducing red tape, you might consider checking that out and uh, and then maybe encouraging some agency personnel to become advocates. I know you guys have to you have that kind of tough balance of being advocates versus just providing information on a given bill. But that one, you know, I, I can't say there's a whole litany of projects that aren't getting done out there because of that cap, and I'm guessing there are some. Uh, the other things, just to alert the public to the existence of the Flathead Trails Association. So this is a pretty cool outgrowth um, from a county plan revision process that started, I want to say, in like 2018 or maybe before that. Um, whole bunch of stakeholder groups, uh, not just recreation entities, but you know, we're, we're real interested in revising the county trails plan. That process kind of fizzled, but the groups stayed together. And uh, it's a great little clearinghouse of information for access. Uh, it's, a, it's a fledgling organization, not quite its own 501c3, uh, but you know, could really use some, uh, some comments if you, think it's worthwhile, if you think it's, you know, bogus, uh, that'd be great. So maybe check out the website and see what you think. Right now, it's just got, you know, a calendar of events, um, and then it can point you to a whole bunch of different stakeholder groups. Uh, and then the last thing I was going to bring up is uh, the Backcountry Horsemen 50th Anniversary Convention is being held in Kalispell, April 14th through 16th. Uh, you know, with the notoriety of being the first backcountry horseman chapter in the in the nation, uh, that'll be a pretty great event, and I think it'll be taking place at Majestic Valley, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So check that out. Thanks, Cliff. Cool. Yeah, very cool. I had asked around if people had anything they wanted me to bring up, and 
at a guy, and I, I hate to speak for people, so I'm not going to say his name, but he's he, one of these guys, he's a trapper that fills all of his tags every year, highly successful, very active in training, puts on trainings for FWP. So he knows his business. And he said, uh, one of the things I'd like to see is snaring and foot trapping. He says they're two different tools, therefore they should be treated as such and separate in the regs. His theory being that, and I'll explain a little bit later, but uh, is that if there's an issue with snaring, he doesn't want that to drag the trapping along with it if, if snaring regulations or lawsuits, whatever, come into play. He'd like to see those kind of very clearly. These are snaring regs, these are tra uh, foot trapping regs, because um, he said quite clearly, if not, it'll bite us in the, well, say, butt one day. Um, and then here's the explanation. It says, snares are not species specific. When a wolf snare is hung, it is the height that will catch a whitetail. Also, it's a perfect height for a black bear. Wolf snares have to have a separate start date to reduce the bycatches. The start date for foot traps should be first Monday after Thanksgiving, and the snare should start January 1st after the deer yarded up for the winter and bears are sleeping uh, or in their dens. The yarded up deer are important, says early December, the deer are still spread out after the rut and can end up in snares when they are yarded up in midwinter. We are less likely to have incidental catches. As an aside, snares are not the main tool for most wolf trappers here in Montana. He says out of 52 traps I have out, there's only four of them are snares. Um, so that, that was his concern. And he speaks for a lot of guys that are pretty heavy into that, that, you know, they're just concerned that uh, snares may bring unwanted attention, heat or regulation that might not affect necessarily affect the foot trapping. I'm kind of like to see them separated for, and you know, that was their articulation, catching deer, catching bears, um, a little bit later start dates. So for what it's worth. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Okay. Yeah. Fairly well connected with the number of trappers. And I would say that that sentiment would probably be yep. uh, echoed. Like I said, he has his finger on the pulse. <laughs> so, and, and has an art, you know, articulates why. So uh, yes. just putting that out there. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's all I got. I just like to say I'm really excited about the the kind of growing research that it sounds like you guys have planned. I'd like to be involved in that, and I'm excited to see kind of what um, what you present for your projects. I'd also encourage um, you know the river the, the river management plan is ongoing, <laughs> kind of because I guess I am a Forest Service employee. I'm privy to kind of where that's at, but I'd encourage FWP to stay engaged in that as well as with other. Um, forest management projects, projects in general. Are you talking about your flathead river? Yeah, comprehensive river, river management plan. What okay, what is the timeline on the next step? Is there anything <laughs> like coming up? I think. I, mean, I can't speak for it. Yeah. I'm, it's really not my uh, forte. And if there's nothing publicly out there, I'm, I'm just curious if there's a, if they've said in 2023, we hope to. Uh, I, I heard by the end of the year is what they're thinking, but. It was originally contracted, and I, I don't know what the status of that is. I think, you know, there's Park Service, Forest Service, um, you know, they've, they've got to figure a lot of things out, different management, uh, you know, missions and objectives. So we have uh, Leo's on that group and provides more biological information for, you know, maybe on how it impacts things. Um, so, yeah. And we did get we did get a request for comment on a draft that I don't think was quite public yet. It was like a, I think there's months, scoping. It right? was a months months. It, well, I think it was the agency a, scoping might have been a little bit more than that. Oh. But it, there wasn't a timeline set on. Just to be clear, I'm not representing the forest service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Sorry. laughs> That's That's why I'm an know. observational. Yeah. I did bring it up. I was like, hey. You guys thinking about this you know because i mean impacts like we've we've talked about those decisions will impact i think fas sites more than you guys realize but maybe the force just doesn't sometimes so, and vice versa so, that's it thanks uh so kind of to bounce off what mark was talking about from the get-go i well, a lot of the conversations we have in here i'm fortunate enough i can kind of bring to the shop and 
talked with a lot of guys that come in. We're, you know, doing about 2,000 plus clients a month. So most of the guys that come in are hunters, fishermen. We kind of built that atmosphere in the shop. So I kind of bounce a lot of the ideas off them. And uh, I did bring up the, the last time, the, you know, raising the out-of-state fee drop. So in order to drop the numbers so we can still supply the, the BMA uh, signing boxes with, you know, a lot of the funding comes from the out-of-state. Uh, and I, I started asking the question to a lot of the guys that come in that, you know, uh, you know, asking, so if we were to say up the deer tags and I, and I kind of went, you know, high number, I said, if we had $50 deer tags <coughs> per in-state, we had $70 elk tags and we could guarantee to, to knock down the out-of-state hunting by 30%, would you do it? And I would say of the hundreds I asked, every single one was a yes. That yes, I would pay that to have less out-of-state pressure. Uh, you know, that means less trips in the woods, uh, less people, your harvest is better, uh, you're not hunting as many days. I mean, God, for 50 bucks, I can't even get to browning in my pickup to go hunting. So a $50 deer tag to me, I mean, that could be steep in some people's eyes, but you know, the guys that say it's too expensive are also wearing $800 Kuyu gear and shooting a $3,000 rifle, you know. Um, so I, I think that is something to definitely approach. Uh, and like I said, I, I threw a high number with the 50 and the 70, but even up in those in-state tags, it's not going to hurt people that bad. You know what I mean? Uh, especially in state, if you could say, hey, we're going to lower the number of people coming in. Uh, across the board, I hear that more than anything that guys go, every time I go over east, I see nothing but Washington. And, and I can admit the same. I go over there and it's Washington, seas of Washington plates. Um, and obviously we need some of that out-of-state hunting. It helps supply the little hotels and gas stations and stores and whatnot over east that really do rely a, a bit, you know, quite a bit on that, that hunting season, uh, uh, people coming in. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, that, that was one thing I kind of want to bring up that that is a definite people are, are, I brought that up and they said, I would do it. I would pay more just to give myself a better opportunity with less pressure. Um, also, uh, um, you know, I, I wish I could have kind of been involved a little more in the, the, the elk, uh, meeting that you did with the, you know, that, it, that group, uh, I think there was some some good stuff brought up and we've talked there's a couple of things that i wasn't big on with the choose your weapon choose your season i feel like that hurts uh the die hard hunters uh pretty bad because i do both I'm, I'm a big archery and i'm a big rifle guy um but that kind of comes back around to um you know this uh this fee scale of out of state in state you know we're going to have less pressure we're going to have better harvest for locals uh, all you guys that hunt, I'm sure you could agree that, you know, I've hunted areas that, you know, you go walking in and run into a guy, oh, there's nothing in here. I haven't seen a dang thing. There's there's nothing there to kill. And I go in there and I'm seeing all sorts of deer, you know, and all sorts of elk. Because it's the way I hunt it because I'm familiar with the areas. Uh, you know, I'm sure we can all agree. You see a, a lot of these out-of-state hunters in a sense kind of fumble around through areas. They don't really know how to approach it with the the winds and all that stuff so i think that kind of tails down to be maybe something that could be added into an idea for the state of you know lessening the number of hunters which in order in my opinion would up the harvest um you see it a lot in the breaks you know actually today i had a few guys in the shop one was a guide over in fort peck area for mule deer and elk uh for 15 years and uh he and I and a couple other hunters that one drew the 417 bull tag this year and one drew the 410. Um, you know, the guy that drew the 417, he hunted 13 days and he's a mountain goat. I mean, the guy's a good hunter and he saw uh, two bulls in, you know, 13 days of hunting and 417. Uh, and the other guy that had the 410 tag, uh, he said he saw three cows the whole time hunting in 410 and saw about 120 bulls and they were all little raghorn bulls uh, and you see it a lot with you know that's a pretty heavily hunted area uh, for elk and it's obviously a, a tag that everybody wants because of the grandeur of you know these giant bulls but they're all nestled down and 
three hundred acre ranches along the the you know the muscle shell, and they and they don't really leave it. Um, and you know, a lot of these out of state guys will draw these coveted tags. And I've I've even seen it myself because I hunt antelope over in the seven hundred district, and I've seen you know uh, these camps of eighteen twenty RVs and pickups, and they're all Washington plates or you know, I've seen Nevada, I've seen all sorts of stuff. And, and one guy has an elk tag, right? And the rest of those guys are tagging along to help him find this giant trophy bull. And, you know, you'll see a whole string of, you know, two, three-year-old muley bucks that to them, it's a, it's a big buck, but they're all these younger bucks. And, uh, you know, you've probably heard it from other folks. You just can't find big, mature mule deer in the, the breaks anymore. They're just really not a good number of those anymore because of, once again, kind of goes back to, you know, grumpy Montana local out of state <laughs> hunters. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think there's some, some sounds like some good stuff brewing. I really also am very happy about the, the elk studies in those areas. I think that's a very crucial uh, piece of information to kind of judge, you know, like you said, uh, forest service uh, habitat and predation. Uh, I read a study, Idaho did something similar where they collared a bunch of mule deer, whitetail, elk, and they found out, you know, predation rates, you know, what they thought it was killed by, you know, what the birth rate was in certain areas, calving areas where they were kind of drawn to. So uh, I'm really excited about that. And I as well would like to, you know, get involved in that and, uh, and, and give you guys a hand with that. I'll quit rambling on and I'll pass it on over oh, here. So. It's like you read my notebook. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think I'll have much to add to that. Yeah, we'll just to echo exactly what I was going to say, I'd be very interested in continuing the discussion that you mentioned, Lee, about a non-resident tags and prices. We brought that up last meeting. Really like to continue that uh, discussion for sure. And thank Ian for all of his yeah. hard work on, uh, yeah, on the... Uh, Health management plan and, and Neil, I want to make sure that my name is on the list of volunteer to catch sure. calves this spring. Okay. I don't know how we go about actually getting your name on the list to be able to do that. Um, but <laughs> we, we put me use, and my two sons on there, please. Okay. Well, I'm we'll sure we'll that. work with Lee and once we come up with an idea of what that looks like. Um, we will be there. Definitely send it out to everybody on CAC. We just look for anybody whose hands smell like fried chicken. Yeah. <laughs> winner, winner. And Stephanie, if you look forward to an email from me, you have access to some um, experienced shooters in this area. The Kalispell area is home to more custom gun makers mm -hmm. and competitive shooters than any other part of the state. And uh, from my family alone teaches 300 kids a year. So. Yeah, I'd be happy to help as well. Thank you. I, I was a builder in the military and I would build shoe houses for uh, operations stuff. So shooting ranges aren't like what I'm specialized in, but I could help. I'd love to help uh, if you guys needed volunteers to help build the shooting range. And I think that'd be like helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited. Sure. Use your loud voice. You just speak up so they can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just excited about the all the research that's going on. I'd like to echo the volunteer to help. Uh, help to do it. Um, forward to ongoing discussions about all the proposals and stuff we have about tags and allocations. You know, just trying to come up with remedies for things. I, I have a dozen different ideas that have come up in the last hours, but <laughs> for another day, but uh, yeah, ongoing discussion, obviously passionate. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't get the microphone again, huh? <laughs> Got it. Um, not a whole lot to add, I guess, on the, uh, like the non-resident hunting pressure item, there is, there is a, I guess, a, a couple bills that are out there if people want to comment um just made aware uh house bill uh 593 it just 
it just states that the department shall publish uh, annual public report that shows the number of licenses sold to non-residents in the previous year for each species, blah, 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 it goes on, but just kind of getting that information out there a little bit more mainstream. So it's, you know, it's not really um, tucked away. And then I think there's a, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't know if it has a house bill number yet. It started out as LC 3621. And uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it was put forth by, by BHA as kind of a, like just a starting point to kind of, you know, steer towards, um, you know, reining in some of the, I guess the extra, extra tags, you know, or what's the impact of upland bird hunters in the state, because that's, you know, unlimited or whatnot, you know, so just kind of looking at that a little bit more. So there's a few politicians and whatnot that are, they're looking at some of those. Um, you said that was LC 3681? 3621. 21. And I don't know if it turned into a house right. bill yet. Yeah. Or I, I might go the research fully and it'll pull up. Um, I guess question for you guys on the, uh, involvement from you know folks in the community on some of the you know some of your capture projects or other stuff you know I mean, the trail cam one like what is what does that like what does that look like what are some of the roadblocks that you guys have run into or do you are you having you know liability issues or is there you know uh well well, even reliability issues with folks saying they're going to show up or what, or, or how do you put that out there to, to get people to? Yeah, the question for a lot of this, these things, you know, it's not, even like the trail camera thing, it's not like you just go walk out with a set of camera. Mm -hmm. There's actually a protocol. It's a very regimented study. So things have to be done just right. So in most of these things, what we, even with the cap capture, what we try to do is probably pair folks up with like a biologist or, or one of the techs who's trained on how to, Take all the measurements you want to do the things that you need to do um, and try to get folks more involved that way. So there will be, you know, there'll have to be some sort of limit because you can't just, like we said, you can't just open up the floodgates and do stuff. So I think those are some of the limits. Um, yeah, in my career, the number of really good volunteers that has been pretty small. I'm not saying that you guys couldn't be, but you have to be pretty careful about because everybody's excited about it and they find out, oh, geez, you know, it's a lot more work or something than I thought it was. So you have to weed those folks out. I think most people in here would be more than capable and willing to do that. Um, so you just have to be a little bit careful not to overwhelm staff with a whole bunch of folks um, and try to figure out what that magic number is and how you pair folks up so that when you're treating the animals appropriately, because you brought up you know, the, the whole stress thing, um, you know, abandonment of calves or mortality of calves because of capture is something that we really be watching for. Um, so it's it's just more, more along those lines. You know, we have limited number of staff that are out there doing that and try to, to pair people up and then just manage um, what that looks like. Um, the camera stuff, I would I would envision, and I'm not the, the guy writing the proposal, so it's kind of me trying to make sure that this happens, but I would envision a, a, a definite need to have at least two people go out on these things because it's sometimes you're carrying stakes and flagging and cameras and then you're working in bear country where it's probably good to have two people so if we can get folks paired up with folks, you know the techs that are going up with the cameras out that's awesome um, but a lot of these are going to be randomly located you might have to walk from the road to the top of the mountain carrying all this stuff so um, i think we have to be honest with folks about what the you know, what the conditions are and hopefully folks will be honest with their abilities as well I would add some of the logistics I've found because I've been trying to get a reporter who's wanted to go out on this for like three weeks now and just the logistics of, you know, it's a three hour drive, the crews get out and start hitting the ground at like seven, seven thirty in the morning. So we got to find a place to stay the night before we're going to drive up there the night before we're going to meet out there you got the right gear or, and so some of it you got to sign all the waiver forms. Um, so some of it's just sheer logistics which as we get a couple of these under our belt I think we're going to streamline. Yeah. Um, and so like, I'll probably send out a, a volunteer form to all of you, have you fill it out in the next few weeks. And that way we've got that in file. So that's one box we can check. And then once we figure out a schedule, you know, we could try to, you know, put a doodle poll out and start finding sure. times that work for all of you. And so you can just see some of the logistics just quickly add up. Yeah. 
that it's taken me like three and a half weeks just to find a way to get one person out. Yeah. Dylan, you're trying to talk us out of volunteers. I don't want you to. <laughs> I don't want you to. Yeah, it's not working. I know. Good. Good. Be there. Good. Uh, some of the worst things that we have to face is that, you know, <coughs> the crew's ready to go at 7.30 and you get a volunteer and they don't want to come out until 9. Or they start showing there's... up to book it. Yeah. 7.30, you're in behind. That's right. Oh, that's right. I hear you. But you know what? You got to beat those washers. Yeah. 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 And, and I, we talked to Kelly about this too. And, and we've got some fairly young technicians that are learning too. And she's actually had a couple of instances where it's been a really bad thing to have a, a volunteer out with some of these techs. Um, you get a one or two bad seeds and it seems to kind of spoil it for, for everybody. So. So I, I want to try to caution against that because I think the tendency sometimes is for us to go, well, we'll just do it then because it's easier. Um, but I think we need folks on the ground to help with some of this stuff because again, we're pretty limited in staff. And to get some of you guys out, especially on like these cap captures and stuff is gonna be really valuable because we need a lot of people. Um, but it just has to be managed. And so I'll pick the people that want to help elk and not just catch elk. Yep. So Lee's out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got my own. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we saw a lot. <laughs> no, I, I think there's lots of opportunity. And I think the folks in here, the, you know, the passion that you guys have and stuff. I'm not worried about the folks in here. Um, it's just how do we how do we manage it is one of the biggest challenges. Right. Just, no, that's what challenge is. Question. You know, and when we I just moved here, hopefully the commissioner can hear me maybe a little better, but with the volunteers is you know, let's say you take a, a group like BHA just to throw out there how many thousands of people there, and there's probably thousands of them that would want to help, but that's not going to happen. So, you know, we work with maybe a representative from BHA, maybe they have a few select people that could that could come out and help. You know, we got a CAC where we're a captive audience. We know you folks, you know, we know what you're probably capable of, we can trust you, and then, and then we, we pair you with somebody from FWP. We pick those opportunities that are going to work. And I, and I put it on Neil, I put it on Kelly and the researchers, you know, it's like doing this ourselves is not an option. We have got to get people involved or for one, we can't do it all, mm -hmm. but other to just get that buy-in and support of it, you need to have people involved and, and you want to help. So we got to facilitate that. It's a little bit of paperwork, you know, it's not much of a waiver to, to figure so that out. We got to, yeah. Yeah, 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 single space, single, single space, space. <laughs> a DNA sample. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, right. Don't worry about it. Be fine. Uh, but no, it's not that bad. And, and, and we're willing to take that work on, you know, and uh, but it's not everybody's going to get the help, but we want to get quite yeah. a few folks out. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of local folks that want to come out too. And that was one of the selling points I had for the project was trying to figure out ways to get local folks involved in some of this stuff so there but it helps brings you know build support for the project but i think it also helps to break down some of the, the barriers between the, for the sportsmen and, and us so. uh commissioner you got a question comment. no I, I i guess what i wanted to do is comment because you know the three or four or five uh, cac members all brought up the non-resident issue and um I think what I'd like to do is make an offer um, that we maybe have a work session or, or an education session because the the conceptual framework that there's just more and more and more coming in that's that's not actually really accurate and and so um, there has been an increase in certain areas, a decrease in others, but it's it's a bigger, broader, complex issue, in particular when you look at how the entire department is funded. Um, and the ratio of non-resident and what, what's charged on those. So it would take a lot more than 50 or $70 per residential tag to make up a material drop in non-residential revenue because of it's, it's like a 10 to one ratio. So I, I throw this out as an offer because I want to understand the issues as they are. I think it shouldn't be lost on any of you that this is 100% in the arena of legislation. Um, but there's two key points that I'd encourage you to try to get some more information on, and that is, especially on hunting on public land, and there's been some litigation that's occurred in other states, the, probably the most recent one occurred in Arizona, but there is an obligation when you have U.S. public land and you have the opportunity to recreate on the land, you can't, you couldn't shut out 100% of the non-residents, um, and not give them any opportunity to hunt on federal land. 
um, because they're Pittman Robinson dollars, everything else that's coming into play. So that 90 10 uh, relationship was basically guided and informed by litigation in trying to create the right blend of how much most states will apportion out to non residents versus keeping for residents. So there's a lot of things like that that would be worth just going through. Now, I may not change your mind at all, and that's fine, but I think the most effective thing that happens when people are advocating for change is that they come in, and maybe Ian could speak to this when he first got on the, the elk working group. You know, a lot of what, what I think are our belief systems and paradigms and things about how things are when you really start getting the real facts on the table, you realize, oh, okay, I, I guess I didn't realize that. There are, I believe, three very important pieces of legislation in play. Now, whether they'll all go through, who knows? One is that reporting uh, requirement. I don't know why that requires legislation. I don't know why the department just couldn't produce those statistics anyway, but having it legislatively mandated, maybe that's necessary. Um, but one of the other interesting ones is a real focus on region six and seven and, and um, uh, eliminating the, the multiple B tag scenario. Cause that Washington plate situation that you were describing where maybe one guy was fortunate enough to draw out of the 17,000, the vast majority of them don't. Well then, but they all come. What they're doing is they're getting B tags. And a lot of times these are over the counter and you know the number of times where people witness non-resident vehicles leaving the state with you know a pile of deer on the back of a trailer and all that, and that just kind of makes you say, "Wait a minute, does that really work?" And I know a lot of people in six and seven are genuinely concerned whether we should be harvesting as many does as we are, and so the department has been working really hard to look at different ways to monitor and see if we are, especially in the mule deer area. So. I just throw out the offer and Dylan can coordinate it, but if we wanna just have a working session where we really talk through the real facts of what's happening, especially by species, <laughs> understanding the, the outfitter point preference system, understanding the 17,000 and how it's allocated. A lot of the programs that Lee was referring to, legislators put in over the last probably 10 years, mechanisms where a lot of people who left the state maybe their kids, maybe their you know, relatives and everything else, they wanted to be able to give them the opportunity when they came back to still hunt, even though they're non-residents. So the number of licensing packages that are available to people who did go up in this state, but you know, like the going, coming home to hunt program and those things. So collectively, they all probably have creeped up a bit. So I think it's a worthwhile exercise to really understand what the sensitivities are and whether they really are creating the kinds of concerns and issues that that you guys are feeling. Um, that'll help me a lot understand what's really bothering you. So I throw that out as an offer. Yeah, and I think and maybe uh, I tried to touch on that. You might not have been able to hear me in the beginning of it, that that was one thing I knew was a popular topic. And the department did just recently put together a, a presentation that they shared with the legislature about those exact things. You know, what is what are the numbers really saying and uh, versus what people perceive? And and I would I was going to work with Molly potentially to have that as an agenda item. I think it'd be something worthy of the entire CAC, at least at that level. It's fairly detailed, gets into all the different types of licenses, explains that the caps that we have, the percentages for non-residents on permit areas and how that works. If you don't have, you know, if you don't use all of the of the permits available, then a non-resident can have more than 10%, you know, all these things. And, and I, I would offer up to put that as an agenda item. And then if we get through that presentation and we need to delve down more into the meat of some really fine-tuned discussions of other things, then we could have a subcommittee or something like that to, uh, to address that, the really down to the NASA ass type of uh, questions, you know, maybe on licensing, but it would be a good uh, item. Anyway, I would, I would, would agree. But Ian, follow up question to that: When you guys made that presentation, did you guys did hunter use or did hunter days 
Did you guys yeah, look, the, try to document I've, that as well? Yeah, I've been through the presentation today just briefly. Briefly, I, I uh, walked through it and it gets at that issue as well. It's like there's a slight increase in numbers in some areas, but the amount of time that hunters maybe are spending yeah. out there has grown. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I guess like that, looking it looks at all that. I, I mean, I would say 2021 and 2022, there was there's an anomaly kind of going on there. Maybe it, maybe it's an ongoing, maybe it's going to be an ongoing trend. There was a big uptick there, a, a measurable uptick, but prior to then, like, if you look at the, I mean, looking at the data, I mean, you look at the number of, well, resident hunting pressure has actually been on the decline. It kind of blew my mind other than, you know, probably the last two years or whatever, but then non-resident hunters have been on the incline. It's kind of, you know, roughly, the total number of hunters on landscape are, are, you know, more or less stagnant. It kind of like, it really caused me to scratch my head a little bit, but then the, the, I guess the follow-up looking at the total number of licenses that are sold in Montana, that's been really climbing. And I kind of wonder, you know, even, you know, our B tag structure it used to be a, a permit. So an elk hunter would go out, he would shoot a cow, he would cut his A tag, he's done. And now he has a cow tag. He shoots a cow and he hunts the entire rest of the season for a better bull. So the hunter, I mean, I think, I guess after looking at some of the data and doing a, a little bit of a dive into it, yeah. the this hunter use days and, maybe and all of that. Yeah, okay. um, and I think it'd be worthwhile because if I remember right off the top of my head, I think the peak was actually 2020, might have been the peak, and then it then it, it was a little bit, a bit of a drop, you know, since then. But more effort. Uh, <clears throat> Is probably the big thing people are seeing is people are going out there for longer. Yeah. Maybe not so much a great big number jump in people, but I'm going to spend seven days instead of two or whatever that. Well, and is. that's so, kind of what I'm. So I think this would be a great topic, and and we happen to have a really good presentation put together. And if we can't put it on to explain to the depth that we need to on it or answer all the questions, we'll just work directly with uh, with licensing. That I think we probably want Emily presentation or Robin to do it on for the legislature to have. They were. They were having it, they wanted to be armed, I think, with that information for potential bills that were coming. So they were making an informed decision. So we'll make that happen. Yep. Excellent. I think we got Kayla, Molly, and Shelly on. Okay, so how about we go, uh, Kayla, are you still around? Yes. In, I'm the, here. in the unheated <laughs> attic? <laughs> I moved downstairs because my kids went to bed. <laughs> um, I am trying to think. Um, I don't know. I didn't really have anything top of mind. Uh, you know, there was other other legislation that um um that i was concerned with uh more public access related um and conservation related i know um let's see i have it here somewhere um where's my notes here uh senate bill 357 that's being talked about right now is uh trying to cut uh cut down on uh conservation easements with state funding um and get rid of uh instead of being in perpetuity uh cutting down the timeline on there so that's one that i was concerned about especially you know coming from working at a land trust where um conservation easements are huge to what we do um and it's huge to seeing uh that public access and these uh natural places are able to be conserved in the long term um that we're able to have those set in perpetuity um so i think that that was really um all that at the the top of my plate i 
Great, thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Yeah, one thing, uh, I know we've had a number of uh, bills come up, you know, today that people are concerned about or have questions on and or uh, opinions of, and I, I think people really, you know, the place to focus a lot of that, I mean, it's a good forum to discuss it and inform others about, but, you know, your, your senator, your, your representative, you know, those are the people, if you've got really uh, directed comments or concerns, you know, be a part of that, that process, the legislative process, and uh, it's reaching out to them, you know, with positive comment. You heard her, you know, informed comments, et cetera. You know, you heard from the legislators that were here. They want to hear about it. And uh, that's, your, that's your way to get things, uh, the needle move one way or the other. You know, a lot of times we're informational on bills. Occasionally we'll take positions, but generally we provide the background and the legislators are the one that make the decision to do it. And you folks have as much or more influence, I would say, than us on, on bills that are getting done. So lean on those folks for your districts and stuff. And, uh, but obviously this is an, a, a venue to share what, what's out there that we don't, uh, you know, need to know about or be aware of as far as legislation. That's not an issue at all with me, but uh, anyway, just throw Lee, uh, to that, to that, to that point, um, when the guys started off talking a little bit about the trapping issues that they're having, you know, the segregation between foothold and, and all that, you should know that uh, Representative Fielder is is got uh, two bills that are back up where he's tweaking the original enabling legislation a little bit. Now, part of it is designed to um, create some more opportunity in in what, how we define the Grizzly Protection Zone, because the commission was somewhat forced since we're in the process of trying to get the uh, Grizzly deed listed in NCDE. Um, we had to get a pretty wide swath, wide, wider than I think, you know, uh, Representative Fielder would have liked. So those bills are up. There could be an opportunity to make an amendment that gives clarification between, um, you know, foothold and, and uh, uh, all the other techniques. So I would encourage you to reach out to him because now's your opportunity. Because once it, that's done, the commission really can't do much with it. Um, in, unless it really is a regulatory item. So if it's a, if it's a statutorily defined thing, I'd get a hold of him as soon as you possibly could to make whatever suggestions you're, you're, you guys want. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kayla. Stay warm. <laughs> uh, Shelly, are you uh, still with us? On the screen, we don't see it, but... Uh, I am. Um, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Okay. Great. And then last but not least, our chair. Oh, did we lose uh, Joe? He, he, he left us. <laughs> see, I don't see him yet. I think we might have yeah. lost Joe. I don't see him anymore. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to thank everybody for a great session and your participation as always, the volunteers who are giving their time from the public and the staff that um, are here so late as, as part of your duties to our great state. So I just really appreciate everyone's engagement. And I think these meetings are extremely enriching. I think our content gets um, even more complex with every meeting as this group feels out um, the way that we all communicate with each other and what we're bringing to the table. So I just, I'm really impressed with um, how this continues to evolve and I'm so grateful to be a participant. So I just wanted to lead with that. Um, and yeah, we've we've talked about the resident and non-resident um, pressure in various um, sectors of our hunting and angling at the state level uh, for numerous meetings now. And so I will definitely work with Lee and Dylan to craft an appropriate agenda for the next meeting so we can bring um, the presentation that they have at hand to this, this group. And um, I'm also going to reach out um, separately to you, Ian, because I only know of one or two other people uh, who recreationally just spend their free time digging into the statistical data that's available by the state. And I'm one of those people. It sounds like you've done that too. Um, and I have I have several ideas on um, 
probably what would be an appropriate project for like a graduate student internship. Um, but assuming that nobody's ever going to want to do that, um, I'd like to, you know, just again, recreationally in my spare time, put together some sort of a GIS with some of the data that's available as well. And if the state doesn't already have that available, because I think it's time that we actually put the conversation around these um, issues. Uh, we want to connect the dots between the policy implications for what has triggered a natural change in the numbers over time, but also really understand what the policies and the um, legislative mandates, as uh, Commissioner Tabor has brought up as well, are, are really doing to drive the numbers that we're talking about and, and work with specifics in our communication rather than uh, grandiose paintbrush statements um, and really get to to the heart of what it is people are concerned about and what the numbers are truly saying. So I'm looking forward to doing that work. Um, I wanna just echo a couple of items that people have brought up tonight about House Bill 144, specifically with um, the competitive bidding process and that opening up huge opportunities for the trail work. Um, I, I assume that people in this room are very aware of House Bill 462 uh, and the Habitat Montana funding um, reduction and threat that's already been brought up tonight. And I know that um, I just want to echo what was already said a second ago, like, please contact your representatives, write letters and um, share with each other in this forum. So I would assume that most people in this room were already aware of House Bill 462. And so having the conversation about a competitive billing process or bidding process and, and how that really matters to um, what goes on out in the woods. Uh, I appreciate, you know, that folks want to bring that up together here, too, as a as another way to point out um, the ways that these interconnected activities that we do outside are really um, all working together. And um, backcountry hunters and anglers, I hope you're already talking to Aaron Augusto um, about getting people, uh, you know, boots on the ground to help with these efforts. Um, and obviously I, I stepped down and, and Aaron took my place. Um, so if you're not talking to Aaron um, to get those volunteer boots on the ground, then I'll definitely bring the troops. I don't know if you would have thousands of people interested, considering they only have like 3,200 deuce bang members in Montana grand total, but we could probably find you 10. <laughs> so um, we can at least help there, I'm sure. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to throw out from like a mixed use perspective, I competed in the Sealy Lake Biathlon a few weeks ago, and that was super cool. I mean, what a special opportunity and I feel like that's a only in Montana moment and to see all our game wardens out there helping support the safe use of firearms that were made available to the public in that forum uh, was just a really cool experience so thanks for for helping put that on too okay uh, we have a couple people from the public, if we don't have anybody else from the board with any questions of us staff or questions for Ian or commissioner, if there's any questions from the public, uh, fire away, Jim, you're up first. Okay, yeah, two things I'll bring up to the group. One, uh, one of the most effective tools to prevent hunting injuries and accidents is to use the hunting orange. And so for the last 10 or 12 years, Flathead Wildlife has teamed up with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and most importantly, Flathead Electric Roundup for Safety Program to provide every graduate of the Hunter Education Program with a Hunter Orange Vest. And uh, I'm just getting the final bids. Hopefully, I'll submit that Monday, and their meeting is the 10th, and I might get you bids in time for this year's class. So we're working on it. But, and it's really cool to be in the check stations and watch those vests go through. <clears throat> uh, Pine Grove Pond is such a gem, and uh, last weekend we did a Becoming an Outdoors Woman uh, ice fishing workshop, yeah, it just worked really good. They all learned how to be safe, warm, and, and they all caught fish, and that creates a lot of confidence. But the use has really outgrown the facilities, and Robin Street's the guy that built it, and Robin was working on building a second picnic pavilion when he passed away, so we asked that memorials be made for a second pavilion. COVID kind of hung us up uh, last fall, working with Tony Powell from Fishing Access and, and the FECC Heavy Equipment Program. We poured the pad, and if this weather ever breaks, sometime in March, uh, we'll build a second picnic pavilion and hopefully have it there when the pond opens. Every I think at one point last spring, 150 hooked on fishing kids there, and we just need more staging areas. Over 2,000. 
Oh, well, yeah. It totally. went through there, but at yes. one time there were 100. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so what a neat place. Neil, do you want to mention mule deer talks? Or? I did a little bit, no, but uh, yeah. Oh, if you did earlier, earlier. go ahead. Yep, we'll just take a look, you know, can repeat that. So in March here, we're talking about having some uh, mule deer discussions to talk about mule deer biology. Is also the, the project and then also mule deer management. We're working on some times. There'll be one here in Kalispell, um, Libby, Eureka, and Thompson Falls. Yep. That's all I had. And we're hoping to partner with you know, Flathead Wildlife, reaching out yeah, to the backcountry hunters and anglers and mule deer foundation as well to see if they want to get a partner on those. That's yep. cool. Gotta be careful on that. He thought I had opinions on elk, like mule deer, <laughs> <laughs> where my passion is. So. We, we may or may not uh -oh. do the dates of the elk. No, we have to have any elk. More passionate oh. people. We said the 16th, not the 15th. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I forget your name, but if you had any questions or anything, uh, comments, no? Okay. Well, Unlike my predecessor, <laughs> well, it is 8.59, uh -huh. and it's cold out, and uh, dark. I appreciate you guys coming. We'll work with, uh, with Molly, like I say, on the agenda. Get it out early. Um, our next meeting tentatively mid -April. is mid-April, so the session may be done or just finishing. And so we may have some legislative updates that we can provide then as well. But I think this licensing discussion is something that it may be a sole agenda item along with a round table because we could really get down into some weeds, which is a good thing. I think in this case, uh, it's a detailed topic. So, but we'll figure that out. And uh, if there's other things you folks want to have, great. Maybe we can up with something else too. So uh, but thanks again for good input and uh appreciate your time okay thanks dear everybody oh